good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to say thank you to Heather and May to give us the chance today to um, have our own session where we can present our, uh, the, well, some of the results that were the um, outcome of our uh, OCB working group on gaps in uh, air CO2 carbon fluxes from observations. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Peter Lanschützer, um, but um, many special things about my name, like the SCH, the Umlaut U, and the TZ, so there's like pretty much three very German things in my name in a row, so don't worry if you can't pronounce it. Um, but, 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 but there's a strategy. Once you remember my name, you'll never forget it anymore. <laughs> um, so yes, um, I'm, I've got the honor here to uh, give an introduction to our working group, which is co-led by Gale McKinley, who will give the first talk of this session, uh, and myself. And uh, we're now in our third year of the working group, so we're pretty much uh, two years into this working group. And when we started about two years ago, we figured that we actually entered a period of uh, enormous richness when it comes to the knowledge about the RCCO2 fluxes. So here, uh, a little schematic which shows sort of the, the three, well, the three layers, how I like to view things. So we've got the atmosphere, the surface ocean, and the interior ocean. And when it comes to co 2 fluxes, um, two years ago, we had a sort of entire set of new knowledge that was coming from um, um, the result of, of the, the surface ocean um, measurement initiatives, uh, mainly from the VOS lines, uh, but also uh, biogeochemical floats which were then coll uh, co um, collected in the, in the big databases like the SOCA database and the LDO database. And based on that new richness of observations, we had like um, a set of new estimates of the air CO2 flux resulting, um, resulting from that data richness. And likewise, two years ago, we also had a sort of new knowledge that was stemming from the interior ocean. Um, um, to be precise, new knowledge about the accumulation of anthropogenic carbon in the interior ocean, which is also the result from uh, the tremendous efforts by the Repeat Hydrography Program, uh, collecting uh, observations that are now collaborate, um, collected in, in the, the GLODAP database. So um, when you take these two together, so basically you've got, got two very independent um, constraints on the air CO2 flux. And two years ago, um, um, actually longer, more than two years ago, people then thought like, okay, we've got these independent constraints, let's put them together and sort of asking the question, do they actually agree with each other? And what we found two years ago is that it was sort of a very frustrating answer to that question, and that is, if you want them to agree, yes, you can have them agree. But if you don't want them to agree, they don't. And the reason for it is rather simple, and that is linked to the knowledge gap that we still had two years ago. So what are those knowledge gaps? And we've seen this uh, really nice schematic that is um, in the result from, from the work of Gayla McKinley and her team. Um, so some of the key knowledge gaps were that when we compare these two estimates, we actually compare contemporary or net fluxes that are the result of the surface um, um, ocean um, estimates versus the anthropogenic carbon, which is sort of what, what the interior-based estimates give us. So we're actually comparing apples and oranges. Furthermore, we noticed that we actually have incomplete area coverages. So even though we're sort of talking about air CO2 fluxes from sort of the surface measurement network, we do still ignore coastal systems, marginal seas, and they also contribute. We also uh, have noticed that we have still substantial data sparsity in some ocean regions, particularly the Southern Ocean, and we still today don't know quite yet how they do influence the um, SCO2 flux variations, particularly on longer time scales. Okay? So the, the purpose of this working group was then to bring together the experts from all these different fields. So those who do ocean, uh, open ocean, um, uh, surface ocean, surface open ocean based SCO2 fluxes, those who work on the coastal oceans, those who work on sort of new, um, new measurements in data, data sparse regions like the Southern Ocean, and uh, sort of also bring the model expertise with the data expertise together, and then sort of find ways how to address these knowledge gaps. And I'm really happy that today in this session we will have a few talks dealing exactly with 
how to close these gaps. So um, this is where I would like to stop and I would, would um, yeah, wish you a um, pleasant session and um, hope you've got good questions for our speakers. Thank you very much. So the, the first speaker will be uh, Gayla McKinley. Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's so great to see uh, almost all the seats filled here in the auditorium, and welcome to the people who are online. Uh, and yeah, as, as Peter mentioned, we've been uh, working on this uh, GAPS uh, working group for the past year, and it's been a really positive experience bringing together experts in a variety of areas. Um, and so I really encourage you, if you have an idea uh, for a working group to go ahead and submit a proposal. They're due in about a month, I guess, is what we heard recently. I'm going to be talking about work that comes from my research group, but uh, is very much connected to these various topics of how do we fill in the gaps in the, in the air CCO2 flux. And I'm going to be using um, uh, models, observations, and machine learning to try to pull together this understanding. So uh, as uh, you are all, I'm sure, well aware, the ocean is an important sink for carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, and you're all surely familiar with this plot from the global carbon budget, where we see the sources on the top from fossil and land use, and then the sinks in the ocean, the land, and in the atmosphere. You might not have looked at the waterfall plot, which is on the right-hand side. I can barely see this pointer, I guess, <laughs> um, which is also an interesting way of looking at the carbon cycle. Uh, and this plot shows, in terms of atmospheric peak, uh, partial pressure, the contribution to the atmosphere from coal, oil, and gas here, the contribution integrated over from 1850 from land use. And it also shows that the land sink is basically, to date, the same size as that land use source. And so that's why I say that only the ocean has cumulatively been a sink for fossil carbon from the atmosphere. So when we think about the future of climate change, uh, if we think about this plot, it's pretty clear that the ocean is really a key part of the future sink, and we need to understand it. We need to understand how the ocean sink is going to change with climate change uh, and how it's going to also respond to the variable atmospheric partial pressure, which is the dominant driver of this sink. And as, uh, as Peter showed you, when we think about the ocean carbon sink, we really need to be careful to make sure we're, what we're defining here, right? So we have both, uh, we have multiple different ways of thinking about the ocean carbon uh, sink. We have uh, and the cycle. So the total carbon, what we observe at the surface is the sum of the natural carbon cycle, which is the, um, the, what existed in the pre-industrial, where we have the biological pump, we have the overturning circulation, we have this increase in carbon uh, from the surface to depth, and of course, the natural carbon cycle is by far the dominant uh, component of the carbon cycle. On top of that, overlaying on top of that, because of our addition of carbon to the atmosphere uh, by, uh, by, fossil, by burning fossil fuels, we are essentially uh, uh, operating Henry's Law at the global scale, right? We're adding carbon to the, par to the headspace above the ocean, and we are driving carbon into the water. And that is the anthropogenic carbon sink. And that is, uh, of course, most of that carbon's at the surface and uh, leading towards zero at depth. And so when we, uh, when we think about our cumulative understanding, sort of the Gruber et al. 2019 estimates of the total ocean carbon uptake, that's only this side. That has been purposely designed to remove all of the natural carbon cycle and focus only on that Henry's Law part. But if we want to understand the variability in the ocean carbon sink, if we want to understand how that sink is proceeding on a year-to-year -year basis, we need to look through uh, uh, the, uh, we need to see both the anthropogenic and the natural part to see this total carbon cycle, the combined effect of all this variability. So here is a plot from the uh, global carbon budget, now with the sink pointing upwards here. Um, and this begins to show you some of the key things that I want to be talking about in this, in this talk. Uh, and that is some of the remaining discrepancies between the two main ways that we're estimating the ocean carbon sink. And that is in the lighter green, which I know is a little hard to see, but those, these are the ones on top. The lighter green are database products, mostly uh, machine learning based products, extrapolating sparse PCO2 data, and ocean models shown in the darker green here. 
For the first time uh, in the last global carbon budget release, the main estimate for the ocean sink used both the ocean models and the data products. Prior to that, it was exclusively the average of the ocean models. But this solid line here and the most recent release of the global carbon budget is the average between this, this, uh, the mean of the product and the mean of the model. The dash line before is based only on the models uh, because that's all that's been available to date uh, for um, prior to about 1990. So, but, but, so this is one of the problems I want to work on. I want to develop a data product from 1959 uh, through present, a uh, database product. So that's one of the things I'm going to try to show you today. And another is to try to begin to address some of this divergence between the models and the products that it seems to be becoming increasingly evident uh, after about 2005. Is that a real signal? Is it methodological? Uh, and I'm going to propose that there's a strong methodological component to it in the machine learning based product. Okay, so but before I get into that, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page about what I mean when I say the biogeochemical models versus the products. So the ocean biogeochemical chemical models are, um, my animation might not work, uh, um, oh well, uh, are uh, um, ocean biogeochemical models are you know, three dimensional um, uh, models of the circulation, uh, physics of the ocean forced by reanalysis meteorology, trying to represent what the real ocean did for the last 30, 40, 50 years or so. And into those physical, that physical model, we've coupled uh, the, the equations that give us some representation of the biological pump and uh, carbon chemistry. Uh, and so, so these are the, the kinds of models that have been, like I said, until last year, the sole basis for the global carbon budget estimate. Um, and typically, the, there's like five or somewhere between five to nine models that have been used in the global carbon budget. It's a group of people every year who update their models to contribute to the global carbon budget. The products are derived from ocean PCO2 data. Okay? So in order to understand the, the air sea CO2 flux, we need to map the surface ocean PCO2, and, and since that is what sets uh, the pattern of the flux. So where the PCO2 is higher than atmospheric, the carbon is flushed out of the ocean, and where the PCO2 of the ocean is lower than the atmosphere, the carbon is flushed in. So negative is into the ocean uh, in my um, uh, 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 sign convention here. So what are the data on which we build these maps? This is a 30-year average uh, map. Well, that's the SOCAT data. This is the 2021 release. The 2022 came out just last week. Um, and these are all the data that have been submitted to SOCAT. SOCAT is an amazing effort by a group of international uh, collaborators, some of whom are here, who work really hard to collect data on volunteer observing ships and on research ships and pull it together into a quality control database. It's a huge effort uh, and really, really uh, critical. Um, this is all the data in the SOCAT, so you can see where it is. From this map, you can see that there are some main big areas that are undersampled. But unfortunately, this is not really what the map looks like. This is more what the map looks like, okay? What we, we, in fact, the data is incredibly sparse, right? And this is one month, right? We want monthly maps so we can map out the interannual variability over the decades. And in fact, what we have is about 1.5% uh, coverage over the last 30 years a few ship transects in each basin uh, in each month. How do you fill in the gaps? How do you do that? Well, luckily, um, we have full coverage data, such as chlorophyll and SST from satellites. And these data are related to PCO2. Okay? So we do, have, um, we do have data sets that are full coverage or approximately full coverage that are connected. And people have realized in the last decade that we can build statistical algorithms based on the points where we have PCO2 data and these uh, complementary or driver data that, is, that are full coverage. We can build statistical algorithms, particularly mostly using machine learning. Um, so you, you train your algorithm based on where all the data exists. Then you have an algorithm with which you can predict PCO2 at all points based on your full coverage driver data. And from that, you can calculate the flux from the PCO2. 
And um, so how do these, the models that I said before, and these PCO2 products compare? So here is uh, my plot of that. We have uh, the GCB models, the global carbon budget models from the previous round. Those are in green. And the blue are the um, uh, 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 six products. Uh, and here we're using the CFLUX product that was published last year by Amanda Fay, Luke Gregor, and others, which attempts to address some of the coastal filling issues and different wind speeds and try to make sure all the, all the, um, all the ancillary parts of going from a PCO2 map to CO2 flux are addressed properly, so that really the only difference between the products are the PCO2 mapping themselves. And so what you can see is, first of all, we have a good deal of agreement between these different approaches, which I would say is a huge success for our community. There's a lot of agreement in terms of the fact that there was a big increase in the ocean carbon sink, for example, in uh, 1991, I'm happy to talk about that with you at my poster today, where we attribute that to the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Uh, and um, then after that effect of Mount Pinatubo, we had very limited uh, growth in the ocean carbon sink over the 1990s, or even a, maybe a decline. And then after 2000, a strong recovery. Now, the magnitude of the recovery is stronger in the products than in the models, so that's the divergence that we still need to understand. Is that methodological? Is that real? Um, and we're still, you know, not everyone agrees with me that this is Mount Pen effect of Mount Penetubo, so we're still trying to understand this, particularly this 1990 slowdown, where and how that works, the role of the Southern Ocean. But, but we have a lot of agreement, so that's positive, but we still have this divergence, and we have a lot of spread in the ocean model. So uh, what I want to try to convince you of today is that the air sea CO2 flux mean and seasonality can be quite robustly reconstructed from the sparse data. Uh, I was quite skeptical of these products when they first came out, when Peter first published his product back <laughs> almost a decade ago. But now I'm really quite convinced the mean and seasonality can, even though we only have 1.5% coverage, we can really do that. However, decadal variability appears to be overestimated. Regionally, the models diverge quite significantly from the, um, uh, from the reconstructed mean fluxes. So we have a pretty good data constraint now, but the models are diverging from it. So therefore, I'm going to propose that we can build a data product that uses machine learning to leverage the complementary strengths of the models and the PCO2 data uh, to build a product that goes back to 1959. Okay, so first question. These PCO2 data are so sparse. Can we really get robust flux estimates, right? And how are we going to know that when we, um, we're never going to go back and observe the full ocean PCO2 in 1999, right? We're never going to know what the truth was. How are we going to know? Well, luckily, we have ocean models, okay? And ocean models do provide us estimates of the full field PCO2 and the associated driver data that you need for a machine learning-based reconstruction. And we have lots of different models. Um, and so what we use in this study is we use four different climate model large ensembles. Those are initial condition large ensembles. We have slight perturbations in the initial conditions. And then different patterns of internal variability evolve within the same model structure. From each of four climate models, we have 25 members. We have 100 members total to build up statistical significance. And we're doing this for 1985 to 2016. So, more specifically, what are we doing? We're taking each individual climate model ensemble member, with, which is 30 years of PCO2 output at monthly resolution. We sample the model exactly as SOCAT was sampled. Then we build the uh, neural network reconstruction. Peter did this work using his SOM FFN approach, reconstructed uh, the PCO2 using that methodology. And then um, return varying PCO2 from which PCO2, uh, from which the CO2 flux can be estimated. And the benefit of the test bed, which only exists in the test bed and will never exist in the real world, is that we know the truth. We know our truth condition. And so we can compare uh, the, um, we can statistically compare the reconstructed fluxes back to the model truth, right? And so we can ask the question of, it, with this sampling and this method, can we do a reconstruction? 
So this is not uh, uh, this is a necessary condition for the uh, reconstruction approaches to actually work. It's not sufficient because we are still within a model world, not with real world uh, model with real world uh, sampling errors and things like this. But it is still necessary. If this doesn't work, we have no hope, basically. Okay. <laughs> so we've done this for 100 members, uh, 485 to 2016. And what we find is that the bias is basically zero globally, okay? Uh, and locally in the northern hemisphere, the bias is extremely small. Even in the tropics, it's pretty small. Regionally, we do get some larger biases in the southern hemisphere. So that would certainly be a concern if you were trying to use a product to you know, really uh, understand what the mean flux was, say, in the Indian sector of the Southern Ocean. But if we look over large regions, the bias is basically zero from these products, from the, this product, this yes one that I've had only. Um, correlation, it will tell us about the phasing of seasonality here. We're focused only on the seasonal cycle here and asking how well can we reconstruct the seasonal cycle. Yellows are above 0.8. And so for the seasonality, you can see on the top map there, the seasonal cycle is extremely well reconstructed with high fidelity. Decadal, decadal um, uh, phasing is much more challenging to reconstruct. And as we show in the paper, we just don't have the, the data uh, to do the decadal reconstruction. For the uh, standard deviation of the error, this gives us an idea of the amplitude of the seasonality. And uh, this, for seasonality, is also uh, extremely well reconstructed, except maybe in the, in the Indian Ocean, where the data are really, really incredibly smart. smart. But for uh, north of 35, we basically have zero error and 5% uh, you know, or so error in the uh, 30 to 35 and south of 35. However, decadal variability is overestimated at the global scale, and particularly in the Southern Ocean where the mean across the 100 ensembles is a 40% overestimate of the decadal variability in the Southern Ocean. And we show in the paper with, this, with adding some additional sampling to the Southern Ocean that it really is a sampling issue. It's not really a reconstruction issue. It's a sampling uh, problem here. Um, uh, so if we could fill in the Southern Ocean with floats, we really could resolve this. Okay, so, uh, and then just going back to this, to just to note that if we had a reduced decadal amplitude, in the products, they would uh, be flatter, essentially, and look more like the models. I have only evaluated the SOMFFN with this paper, but in other work that we've done, we've evaluated more, more generically XGBoost, random forest, and neural network algorithms, and show basically the same um, uh, results in all of them. So that's why I posit that really all of the products probably overestimate the decadal variability. Okay, so that's why I come up with this take-home message. Okay, moving on. The products capture the regional means and seasonality pretty well. How do our Hindcast Ocean models compare? How, since, since I'm trying to convince you that we actually have a data, uh, a data constraint that we can now apply. So this is, uh, this is some work where we took the uh, uh, global budget, carbon budget models shown in green and compared it to seven of the products. And we did this for the global on the bottom, but I want to focus here on these large uh, super biomes where we have the northern hemisphere high latitude, northern hemisphere high latitude, northern hemisphere subtropics, equatorial, southern hemisphere subtropics, and southern hemisphere high latitude. Okay? So in each region, we have all of the products, the mean, we've added the riverine correction and its uncertainty uh, based on the one by one from um, from LaCroix uh, distribution. And the big picture point is the products all agree very tightly in most of the regions. You can barely distinguish them from one from another in the northern hemisphere of high latitudes or the northern hemisphere of subtropics in the equatorial. Very, very tight estimates from the products. They're all giving us the same result. But the models have this really wide spread, okay? Particularly if we look somewhere like the southern hemisphere subtropics or the southern hemisphere high latitudes. The models are outside, um, uh, in fact, uh, two-thirds of the models are outside the three sigma of the products in at least one of the biomes, all right? So very, uh, so a big divergence in the model. I'm, I don't have time to show it today, uh, but the paper also documents some significant seasonal errors, particularly at high latitudes, and other papers have shown this, such as Precious Mongwe's work in 20, 
uh, 18 in the Southern Ocean. So the models have significant mean biases and seasonal problems. So can we pull this together? If our ocean models have substantial mean and seasonal errors, and our products, however, capture the mean and seasonality, I'm going to propose a hybrid approach in which we pull together the strengths of the models and the data products to give an estimate of the CO2 flux, uh, the, the variability, and monthly one by one uh, from 59 to 2020. Okay, so this is the LDO hybrid physics data approach, uh, where we're using both ocean biogeochemical models and the SOCAT data and full field driver data. Essentially, what we're doing is we're taking a prior, which is the PCO2 uh, uh, from eight ocean models. So it's a monthly field of PCO2 for each month uh, from the model. The target variable for the machine learning based reconstruction is not the PCO2 itself, but it is the misfit. We're saying, how off is the model wherever we have SOCAT data? That's what we're uh, trying to get the machine learning to learn that relationship so that then we can predict it at every point uh, and every point in space and time. So an XG boost algorithm gives us a full field misfit based on the driver data. And then the final estimate is the sum across eight models of the original model plus the misfit. Okay? Happy to talk to you about the details there, but essentially it's a statistical algorithm to correct the model. Okay? So here are some full coverage misfits that I wanted to make the point that these are individual for each of the models and each month. Okay? So this is the average JJA, the average DJF, just for the MPI and CRM as two example models. And you can see, for example, MPI needs huge corrections in the Southern Ocean, uh, a different sign, of course, uh, that's, that's a seasonality correction, while CNRM needs the opposite signs and much smaller corrections in the Southern Ocean. Okay, so the models have very different um, fields uh, of correction that are needed, and I'll just make the side point that actually these fields themselves can be useful input to the model development process because it points to the modeler, oh, not just that you have one little point in SOCAT that's wrong, you know, that's off from SOCAT, but we have a full field understanding of how the model is diverging. Anyway, so different for each model. However, we find that the climatological misfits in all cases are much larger than the interannual misfits. Okay, so this is the Princeton model, uh, and the comparison uh, I'm showing you is the climatological misfit in the Princeton model on the top and the standard deviation of across the years on the bottom, okay? So this is negative 100 to 100 range, and this is only 0 to 25. So the point is that climatologically, the models need big corrections, but they don't need such huge interannual corrections. Mostly across the ocean, it's under 5 microatmospheres. So therefore, we say, well, if the climatology is most of the answer, what if we only correct the models with that climatology? How close to uh, independent uh, uh, validation data can we get in that case? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for the period in which I actually have independent observations, so for uh, 82 to 2020, I'm going to build both my main um, uh, reconstruction, which is uh, the model plus the interannual misfit. I'm also going to build a test, which is the, the model plus just the climatology of the misfit, to say how much of my answer is coming from the climatology. And I'm going to show you these Taylor diagrams. Uh, this is GLODAP, which is not in the SOCAT. And this is LDO, PCO2, also not in the SOCAT. So these are independent data. Uh, and in a Taylor diagram, what we're really trying to get to is down to this red star here, right? That would be perfect correlation and the exact same standard deviation as the observation. So I'm starting with the models themselves. You can see where they fall on that Taylor diagram, correlations to the data on the order of 0.4 to 0.6 and a range of standard deviation. If I apply only the climatological uh, misfit and then average all the models, I significantly improve uh, the comparison to the independent observations. Now the correlations are about 0.85, and the standard deviation is just a slight underestimate. But what might be really surprising is that if I now go to the, add the interannual misfit, it's only a tiny bit more improvement. Okay. Against LODAP, uh, it's really, uh, really minor. Against LDO, it's a bit better. Uh, 
but essentially all of my gain has come from the climatology. And if I compare to the other uh, products here, I find that the resulting, when I do add the interannual variability, it's as good as any of the other ones. And even with that climatological correction, it's uh, better than some of the other products that are out there. So because of this, I am motivated to then apply that climatological misfit, recognizing that it's not probably the full truth, but it is at least much of the truth. I'm, I'm motivated to apply that in the pre-observed period from 59 to 82, and then carry on with my interannual misfit following that. And so this is the final result. Uh, the dark blue line is our database estimate of the RCCO2 flux variability from 59 to, um, to 2020. The light uh, blue line here is with that climatology test here. So you can see it has the same timing of the variability because all that variability is coming from the models, but this is just has a lesser interannual variability. So we can therefore also project that probably we are underestimating the variability back here uh, because, um, because of that comparison. I've also put on here the very uh, recently published Yena MLS extension back to 59 that has a, a, a bigger trend, uh, but uh, very, very much the same variability. So therefore, uh, we now have, uh, as some of the progress we've made in the past couple of years, is we now have estimates of the RCCO2 flux variability from 59 to 2020. And also, if you look closely here, these new estimates don't diverge quite so much in the end state, although I would say that divergence is something that we still do need to keep working on. So uh, that is uh, uh, my take home messages and the clock says zero, so I'm probably over time, but thank you everyone. I'd be happy to take your questions. Many thanks, Galen. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, I see one here. Thank you, Galen. That was a, a great talk. My question is a little geeky, um, and it's about how we use chlorophyll as a metric of biomass. Um, there have been a good few studies especially in the Northwest Atlantic, where it's strongly suggested that as we transition from a diatom large cell um, dominated assemblage into the summer uh, small cell assemblage, that chlorophyll no longer becomes a very accurate um, proxy for biomass, but yet those tiny cells, which re represent less than one milligram per meter cubed of chlorophyll, they're still very busy drawing down carbon dioxide. Um, I just wonder how that factors into that, that global picture that, that, that you gave us. Yeah, well, not, uh, uh, not uh, explicitly, of course, but what I guess what we're hoping is that the statistical relationship uh, developed would uh, you know, be able to adjust to the summertime what the chlorophyll is versus the uh, um, versus, you know, the, uh, the uh, shoulder seasons when it might be more diatom dominated. Uh, but I definitely think, I, I, so, one, so I will say that we, we, do, we do see differences in the scale of the reconstruction. For example, um, when we only have climatological chlorophyll, for example, prior to 98, so we try to focus our, after 2000, so I do think it's important. But whether if we use the biomass proxy versus chlorophyll, it's not something we've tried. I don't know if something is for the Peter's tried. Uh, I don't know how much that would, would matter uh, or if the statistics could, could manage that. Um, so. so we've got time for one more question. Spin the wheel, maybe. Spin the wheel. <laughs> so we'll, just, just for the others, we'll have a discussion, a discussion session at the end, so keep your questions. You can ask them later if you don't have time now. Hi, Galen. Uh, fantastic talk there. Um, I have a quick question, which is that were you able to attribute the variance in the model spread for the individual models used in the PCOT um, model constructions to any particular differences within the model physics or ecosystems or anything along those lines? And could you use, you know, these results in order to inform um, model improvements and infrastructure changes in the future? Yeah, so uh, we have not done that yet, uh, but the fact that the uh, correction structures are so 
uh, climatological primarily, uh, suggests that it is a kind of underlying issues in the circulation biology of the models, right? Uh, and we are going to be working on that, particularly with the CSM model in the coming years. Uh, and we're talking to the other Heinkast model developers about how they make, make use of the model field. So I, I hope it becomes useful. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But, I, but yes, let's, let's work on that together. Happy to talk more. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, let's thank Galen again for a great talk. Our next speaker is uh, Lily Kepler, who made her way from uh, San Diego to us today. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here and to see you all. And also, hello to everyone who is here online today. Uh, so my name is Lily Kepler. I'm a postdoc at Scripps in San Diego, the traditional land of the Kumeyaay people. Um, but my work I'm presenting today is actually part um, of work I've done previously in um, Hamburg in Germany together with Peter um, Lanschitzer, Nikki Gruber, and Sip Laufstedt. And so I want to take you now on a journey to the interior ocean. We've already heard from Galen about uh, the ocean carbon sink um, at the surface, so I want to do a, just a very quick recap here um, that the ocean carbon sink between 2004 and 2020, which is the period I'm interested in, was about 2.9 plus minus 0.6 petrograms of carbon per year. And we can see that here on, the, on that nice plot from the observations and the model. Um, so this um, total flux actually consists of the air sea CO2 fluxes, which is about uh, 2.1 plus minus 0.5 petrograms of carbon per year. And then on top of that, we also have the riverine flux. So the air sea is obviously at the surface. And then the, uh, the river in is the carbon that enters through the rivers. And here I've put in a higher end um, estimate that we have that's 0 0.8, plus minus 0.4 petrograms of carbon per year. But those estimates vary and can be as little as 0 0.2 petrograms of carbon. And I think this is what Peter mentioned um, earlier, where um, he said it depends a little bit what we compare. Sometimes the two things fit together and sometimes they don't. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so what we wanted to know is um, if we can constrain the ocean carbon sink from the interior observation. So what can we learn from the interior ocean about the ocean carbon fluxes? So this is now rather than measuring really the carbon that's going in and out of the ocean at the surface and from the rivers, it's looking at how much carbon is accumulating in the global ocean and measuring that, and we can then compare it to the fluxes. Um, so we have these two perspectives two perspectives at the surface and from the interior, and I want to um, I'll put them up here as a sort of contrast to the pros and the cons of each of the um, two perspectives. So yeah, at the surface, we have a lot more measurements. Galen um, has shown the nice maps with all the ship tracks. So in the interior ocean, that's a lot less. But then the, the data obviously extends from the surface to depth. Um, we, at the surface estimates, we have large uncertainties like I um, mentioned for the river, but also with the gas transfer velocity um, and also with the skin temperature. So we don't measure the direct fluxes, we measure the PCO2 and from that infer the fluxes. Whereas with the interior ocean, uh, it's a more of a direct approach. We really just look at what, how, what, how's the carbon changing and that's basically what must have come in or gone out. Um, at the surface, we can not separate the anthropogenic and the um, natural components, whereas in the interior ocean, we can do that. And then there's the river adjustment that I've already mentioned, which we need at the surface, which, we, again, we don't need at the interior. And then over the last sort of decade, I would say, there's been a lot of studies that have come out um, about the um, surface perspective, and there's a lot less still that's been done at the interior ocean. Um, and the focus there has been pretty much only on, at a global scale anyway, it's been only on the anthropogenic component. Um, what we can do with the interior perspective as well is um, that we integrate over large areas in time, well, large areas in space and in time then as well, and that can give us a very robust estimate of the mean fluxes and the trend. So each of the two perspectives um, has its own weaknesses, as we can see, and its strengths. And so if we can, if we're able to constrain the ocean carbon sink from both perspectives, 
then uh, we have a lot more knowledge and get a little bit closer to knowing what is happening with the ocean. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at the previous observation-based studies of the global um, scale interior carbon. So we've got the GLODAP data, that's high quality ship data from the repeat hydro hydrography survey program. Um, and then based on that, um, Lauffer et al. created an interior DIC climatology. So where we have the mapped fields, where we can see the patterns of where the carbon um, is in the ocean. But from that, we didn't know much about the changes over time yet. Then in 2020, two monthly climatologies were published, um, also based on the GLODAP ship data. So there we learned for the first time about the um, seasonal cycle in GIC in the interior ocean. Um, but again, not much, or yeah, yeah, not much about the longer term changes in the carbon sink. And then we have the studies uh, that focus on the anthropogenic component of um, carbon, which are focusing on the decadal changes that we can see. Um, yeah, and this anthropogenic um, accumulation of carbon we can see here now on the right. You might be familiar with this plot. This is from the study by Kubert, 2019. Um, that's the anthropogenic component, uh, the increase in the Pacific sector. Um, but what we wanted to, with, wanted to do with this study is we wanted to really see the increase or the changes in the total DIC, so that's the natural and the anthropogenic component combined. And we want to do this at a global scale. So we wanted these time-varying interannual mapped fields of the total DIC. Um, sorry, there's a bit of a formatting problem, but that's OK. <laughs> you can see it, OK. Um, so we created these mapped observation-based fields of oceanic dissolved inorganic carbon, or short Mobo DIC. And so we used the GLODAP data, which you can see on the top left, yeah, on the top. Um, so we can see already there's a lot less data than at the surface in SOCAT. But then this is, um, these are repeat hydrography sections. So um, at the same lines, we have multiple observations over the years. But yeah, there are very large gaps in time and in space. Uh, we then uh, um, adapted a cluster regression approach to create these mapped fields. And this is an adaptation of the SOM FFN method. So this is one of the um, uh, machine learning approaches that Galen mentioned that have been developed at the surface. And we adapted this now for the interior ocean to create these yeah, mapped fields of interior DIC. And uh, this is a big step up from the past methods that were only able to constrain the anthropogenic component um, part of this uptake. So the first um, thing that we did is we created a monthly climatology of um, Mobile Dig, um, but I'm actually focusing on um, this new and upcoming data set that we've created, which resolves these interannually varying fields. Um, you can see the spatial resolution on the, on the map, um, and it extends to 1,500 meter steps. And um, as I mentioned, it's based on this cluster regression approach, so we use um, as input parameters, temperature and salinity from Argo, and then um, nitrate, silicic acid, dissolved oxygen, as well as time and atmospheric PCO2, as they're all predictors that we use together with the GLODAP DIC data to create these mapped fields. Now, um, I feel the, the maps uh, look quite pretty, but we don't know yet um, how, how much we can trust these. So we've done a lot of comparison with independent data. And I want to show this here, what it looks like in the Southern Ocean. Um, I've um, divided the region here in those three regions, marked in green, purple, and orange. And we're then looking at it at 10, 100, and 1,000 meters. Um, and these are now, um, we're comparing this here with data with the, from the SOCOM floats, uh, so Argo floats with um, biogeochemical sensors in the Southern Ocean. And Basically, what we can see in the solid line is the mean from the Argo flows, and then the dashed line is um, our Mobodic estimate of DIC at the time and of, of the location of the circum flows. And that's the dashed line. And so we can see the two estimates agree um, pretty well uh, with each other. If you look at it, uh, the root mean squared error is about 14 micromoles per kilo in all of the subregions, and the bias is between 3 and 8. 
Um, overall, the uncertainty of the data product is about 18 micromoles per kilo, so it is within the uncertainty. And so it's quite an encouraging sign that the me method uh, generalizes quite well. And something we've also found that Galen mentioned earlier is that especially when we average um, over large areas in, in space, um, the bias is basically very close to zero. So especially when we look at the global um, integrals and the whole basins and so on, we have um, high confidence in what we, what we see. We've done a lot of other comparisons as well with other data that I don't have time to go into now, but happy to talk about it throughout the week maybe a bit more. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at the global um, ocean carbon storage that we found. So here, uh, this is um, yeah the increase in DIC that we can see and also the variations um, in our um, study domain is now for different depth slabs, um, 150 then to 300 to 70, uh, 700 and to 1500 meters. And we can, well, most sort of strongly see that increase in DIC but also some interesting variations. And this is really the first direct assessment of the changes in the total DIC, DIC stock that we have from observations. And so it's our additional constraint on the ocean carbon sink based on interior observations. And um, we've now upscaled this um, estimate as well beyond our study domain, so that it includes now also the coastal and high latitude regions and the ocean below 1,500 meters. And here we find an increase of about 3.1 plus minus 0.7 petrograms of carbon per year, which is about 30% of the anthropogenic um, emissions in that period. Hmm. Uh, we can now compare this with the SECO2 fluxes. Um, so there were uh, 2.1 petrograms of carbon per year plus minus 0.5 in that same period, plus the riverine flux. Um, the high-end one gives us an estimate of 2.9 plus minus 0.6 petagrams of carbon per year. And so these estimates are actually remarkably close to each other, especially if you consider how um, they're based on completely different data, the SOCAT versus the GLODAP. Um, and so that's quite an encouraging sign. Uh, we can also now compare this with the anthropogenic carbon estimated by Sabine et al. and by uh, Kuba et al. We scaled this to our period now using some assumptions, which I can go into um, in the question session if you like. Um, and this um, estimate, so it's now comparing the same period, is also 2.9 plus minus 0.4 petrograms of carbon per year. So this is again also very close to our estimate of 3.1 petrograms of carbon per year. And the fact that these are so similar. Um, basically means that we don't see much of a change in the natural carbon yet, but I'll go a little bit more into that uh, towards the end of this talk. Um, yeah, but I want to pause here for a second to just really let that sink in, how far we've actually come, and sink in, pun intended. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we have come quite far to constrain the ocean carbon sink now from the surface and now from the interior. So now let's have a look at what this looks like as a spatial distribution. This is now the vertical integral of our, uh, the, inc the trend in DIC um, from Robotic. And we can see some really interesting patterns here. So we see the strongest increase of DIC in the North Atlantic, which is the region of known um, increase or uh, sorry, uptake in anthropogenic carbon. We see a lot of a, a much weaker um, increase in the Southern Ocean, which makes sense. It's an upwelling region, so here the faulting is mostly from below. But we don't see as much of an anthropogenic signal here. And then we also have some interesting patterns in the North um, Pacific, um, where the DRC is decreasing during our period. We're still looking into this a little bit more to understand this, but from our an analysis until now, it seems like this is um, associated with the phasing of, of the PDO. And so if we had a longer time series, um, this negative signal would very likely disappear. And so it's not something linked necessarily to the anthropogenic perturbation. OK, now we can also have a look at the vertical section. So this is now for the Indian, the Pacific, and the Atlantic sector. Um, so the um, latitude is on the x-axis and depth on the y. Again, we can see similar patterns as what we already saw 
on the map. Um, so we see the strongest CIC near the surface in the upper about 1,000 meters. The North Atlantic sticks out again, and the Southern Ocean is a lot weaker. Um, we also see the sea uh, decrease in DIC again in the North Pacific. And so now this raises the question, which of these changes are associated with the anthropogenic um, carbon and which one with natural carbon? So just a quick recap um, again on this uh, beautiful schematic. Um, we have the total DIC, which I'm highlighting here. This is what I've been talking about. Uh, which consists of both the natural and the anthropogenic component. So if we know the anthropogenic component, we can subtract it from the total to get to the natural um, component. And we use again that uh, the combined estimate by Sabine et al. and Gruber et al. Um, of the anthropogenic carbon and scale it to our period now. So the top row now shows us the plot I've already shown you. That's the trend in DIC of our period and the Bottom row now shows us the um, delta C answer, so the change in the anthropogenic carbon. Um, and to the first order, they look very similar. Um, so the change in DRC is very approximately the same as um, the change in the anthropogenic carbon, from which we can then deduce this, that the natural um, carbon is not changing much at all, especially not within the uncertainties um, that we have. Um, sorry about the formatting. <laughs> yeah, you can read it off. Um, yeah, but we can now also uh, look at the, car at the natural component. So we've now subtracted the anthropogenic component from the total DRC to get the natural component. Um, and again, we can see those interesting features. The loss in the um, North Pacific in most other regions is the gain of natural carbon. But I would say um, this is something to take with a grain of salt because the uh, amount of the natural carbon is well within the uncertainty of the other two products. It's more to have a look at it for now and if in the future we can reduce the uncertainties, we can look at that um, a lot more robustly. But from this analysis we found if we integrate this change in natural carbon in space, that's about uh, 0.3 petagrams of carbon per year. But yeah, the uncertainties are about 0.7 for, for Moby Dick and I think 0.3 per year um, for the sea and estimate. Um, we'll do the same now here for the vertical section. Again, to be taken with a grain of salt, um, but there might be a potential loss of natural carbon um, at the sea surface in the, um, except in the North Atlantic and a potential loss of natural carbon in the subsurface North Pacific and maybe a gain of natural carbon at mid-depth, especially in the tropics. And so this might be explained by this a vertical redistribution and um, an upward transport of natural carbon. But yeah, as I said, this is something we can hopefully constrain with a bit more certainty later, further on into the future. Now we've also looked at the interannual variability of the DIC, which I define here as a standard deviation in the time dimension. And we've detrended the time series here and removed the seasonal cycle to really only look um, get the interannual signal. So that's again for the Indian and the Pacific and the Atlantic, where we have depth on the Y and latitude on the X axis. And generally, um, we don't find that much interannual variability. And the most um, pronounced variations are in the, um, in the tropical Pacific and just below the thermocline. That signal is very strongly linked to ENSO. Um, and in the Southern Ocean, we have actually very little interannual variability, but very close to zero, which was a bit of a surprise because we know from the surface fluxes that we have a lot of variation there. So, yeah, <laughs> that discussion is to be continued, I guess. So now what does this all mean for closing the gaps in the observation-based estimates of the air sea carbon fluxes? So we now have the mapped observation-based estimates of the oceanic DIC, the Moby Dick, at monthly resolution from 2004 to 2020. And I should mention with now, this is still work in progress. We're hoping to submit this soon. Uh, we can now direct assess the changes in the total DIC stock. And as I said, this is the first time that we can do this from based on observational estimates. 
and so we can now constrain the ocean carbon sink based on the anterior observation. And we found the CIC, <coughs> sorry, the CIC increase of 3.1 petrograms of carbon per year plus minus 0.7, which is about 30% of the anthropogenic emissions. And as we said, this was very close to the surface flux estimate of about 2.9, and also the increase in anthropogenic carbon, which is also 2.9 petrograms of carbon per year, which led us to um, the conclusion that the change in natural carbon very close to zero, and the changes that we see are within the uncertainty of, the, of um, our estimates. There may be an upward movement of natural carbon that leads to this um, loss of natural carbon at the surface, um, but yeah, as we said, the signal is within the uncertainties. And then for the interannual variability, um, there we found them to be most pronounced uh, below the mixed layer, below about 150 meters and it was most dominant in the um, equatorial Pacific. Um, but we're not done yet. Uh, there are still some remaining gaps um, to be closed, also from the interior perspective. So we still need more observations to reduce the uncertainties in the mapped um, estimates. That's especially the case in the Arabic Sea, the Eastern Pacific, and the Southern Ocean. Um, it would be also great to be able to extend the domain of Moby Dick further, to extend deeper than 1,500 meters, to include the high latitudes, the coastal regions, and also eventually to go back further in time to be able to look at the decadal variations as well. Um, it would also be great to estimate the Southern Ocean carbon inventory from the biogeochemical Argo floats. Um, so Moby Dick only uses ship data for training, so this would be a, a great uh, project um, as well as part of SOCOM, I guess. Um, and then also the CN um, estimate that I've used now was a scaled estimate to our current period, and here it would be great to really be able to compare this um, to the current period, and this is something that um, Jens Müller at the ETH is currently working on. And then eventually it would be also good to look at other carbon system parameters like alkalinity and pH to really understand the whole carbon cycle as a whole system. And with that, I'd like to thank you, and I look forward to your questions and comments, and maybe chat over coffee at some point during the week as well. Thank you very much, Lydia. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, one hand up here. Get him. Thank you. Uh, great talk, also. Uh, yeah, to. I have a question about this river flux thing. I understand river flux itself. Now, when we add that pre-industrial river flux to the observed the net SeCO2 flux, get this anthropogenic CO2, I can envision that most of that river flux goes back to atmosphere near shore area. Now, when you compare that to your mobile dick, that anthropogenic CO2, that's open ocean, the deep ocean, Part. So I'm a little, I don't know, that just seems add more uneasiness to me to how we really compare things and, and match them up. Yeah, uh, do you mean the fact that we're not um, thinking about river fluxes at all with, within Mobile Dick? I don't know how much is really considered that, you know, how much of that river carbon really go out, why it was not directly measured in the air sea flux, you know, how much is measured, really, how much is missing, maybe not just for you, really, for your team. Yeah. I wonder if the surface um, community has knows more about this. Stuff. Yeah, I'll just add to that. So basically, the, we have estimates of how much has moved into the open ocean and how much would be effluxing uh, across uh, the globe, based on model estimates of the distribution. Right, so the idea is that the river, it's the, it's the carbon, the probably long-lived uh, DOC that's existing in the ocean and raising the PCO2 and causing an efflux uh, uh, every, in the open ocean. So those, but the estimates are very uncertain. So, yeah, that's the, so it's, the, it's, the, it's how we get from the total carbon flux um, to the anthropogenic part from the surface. So, yeah. Ray will be talking about this, I believe. And so there'll be another talk in a uh, couple minutes. So it's, it's a, yeah. Okay. We'll go. We, we have another question over there. No, no, for people online.
Uh, thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. Uh, I'm curious, the uncertainty estimates, have you done kind of an observing system simulation experiment like the one Galen described, uh, sampling like a model uh, with a similar distribution? Yeah, good question. Um, we have done a comparison with synthetic data where we used um, the HAMOG model, part of the MPI model, where we did a similar thing, but not with, a, uh, with an ensemble, um, just with one model, uh, where we did create a synthetic data, um, ran our method to see how uh, well it works. I don't think I've got an extra slide for that. Um, no, but well, I've, I've got here a table of all the comparisons that we did, and the hammock um, roughly in the middle shows just the bias and the root mean squared um, error for that, but I don't have a map to really show that. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Thanks. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> a little close to the mic. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. I was just curious um, whether you saw opportunities for combining the surface and deep ocean perspective. It was sort of presented as two separate approaches that could be compared. Are there ways to bring them together into a single estimate? Um, I haven't thought about it so much yet. <laughs> I guess you could look at the GIC just at the surface or, and compare it with like um, uh, Greg and Gruber published um, a data set of not only PCO2 but other parameters, including DIC as well. Um, I have done a comparison with with that. Yeah, I guess yeah, I guess we have done it, <laughs> uh, which you can see here. But mostly to sort of as a sanity check, how well do they compare? But we haven't done an in-depth scientific um, comparison of what this then really all means. But this, well, this is here the comparison between the ocean soda estimate and ours, as well as the, the mean, the trend, and the interannual variability. Okay, this question is from Andrew Dixon. Uh, the GLODAP lines are not really covering a range of seasons as they were done when it was logistically convenient. How does this likely alias your results? Can you say the last part of this question again? How does this? How does this likely alias your results? I think you mean bias, bias yeah. your mm -hmm. results. Um, so, well, the seasonal um, analysis, we, well, in this analysis, we've pretty much smoothed out the seasonal um, cycle. But in our, in our previous um, study where we really looked at the seasonal cycle, we did um, a lot of comparisons with um, yeah, the soak and float and at hot and at best and so on. Um, we found maybe nearly surprisingly that the seasonal cycle is um, represented really well because of how robust the relationship is between the predictor data and the GIC where we have it. So even in, <clears throat> maybe if I show the, um, sorry. <laughs> if I show the uh, plot again from the SOCOM comparison, here we can, See this glowed up data. There's in the Southern Ocean hardly any uh, wintertime observation that goes into Mobile Dig, but it, in the surface we can really see the very pronounced um, um, seasonal cycle that we find from the Stockholm flows as well that we see in Mobile Dig. We have time for one quick mm -hmm. question. Ah, yeah, Lynn? Hi, Libby. Hi. Um, question. As we're building um, global BGC Argo, um, we're now heading out to beyond the Southern Ocean, and maybe a question for everyone. Um, are there areas that are especially sensitive that we should make sure we're not missing at the beginning? We're going to eventually be global, but it'd be great to have the discussion about um, what to focus on. Great. Yeah, thanks. Lynn, it's a great question. I think eventually it would also be good to use the biogeochemical flows as a combined estimate um, um, as well. Um, something I didn't actually mention as part of our method was is uh, that we run our method um, 15 times as a sort of bootstrapping approach and we create an ensemble 
where we take the mean as our final estimate, and then the standard deviation um, across the mean gives us a prediction uncertainty, basically an estimate of how, where the method works, how well. And from that, we, we can see on these maps a little bit where, um, where the highest uncertainty is. Um, so yeah, the Eastern Pacific and the Arabian Sea, as well as the North Pacific, really stand out here as regions. Um, the Southern Ocean always gets mentioned, but it's, yeah, in some regions, maybe the Southern Ocean as well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We've come to the end of the first part of the session. We now have a short break, and then we'll continue with another set of talks. All right. Thank you. I'm Ajar, Professor of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science at uh, Penn State University, to talk about uh, uh, land to ocean loops of carbon. Take it away. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, Heather, uh, Victoria, and Drew for getting us off to such a great start, getting us back together again, and also just setting a very um, welcoming uh, tone. It, it's uh, re really wonderful to, to be here. Okay, so I'm going to be talking really about a paper that was just published. Um, led by Pierre Renier, and this is in no way a disclaimer for the talk, but Pierre really, um, and, and Laura uh, Respondi as well, have just done a tremendous amount of work on this paper, and I'm kind of just a sort of a representative of it and, and got um, added to the effort after Pierre and Laura started talking about some of their um, common interests. And uh, this uh, really started for me in um, early, mid-2020, and honestly, this project uh, did a lot uh, to help me get through, the, get through the pandemic. It was a great um, uh, distraction, as it were, uh, to keep my mind off of uh, more, more troubling things and feeling like I could make a difference. So, so we're going to be talking about something that's already come up in, in a few of the comments um, and, and in the introduction by... Uh, Galen and Peter about this land to ocean transfer of carbon, which leads in part to um, uh, an outgassing of carbon dioxide uh, from the ocean. That's a natural uh, process. So that was one of the motivations of this study is to address this land to ocean carbon transfer, which is really a key component of the global carbon cycle and, of course, unites the land and the ocean, which are often studied in kind of separate you know, by separate groups of scientists and uh, with their own techniques. And this sort of river uh, transfer is not, um, uh, is not really uh, addressed very well. And in fact, just I'm using that word transfer, it's a lot more than that. There's a, lot, a whole lot that's going on between, say, the head of tide, which I would define, if we're going to define the land-ocean boundary, I would define it at the head of tide, not by salinity, really, because I consider tidal freshwater still to be uh, marine, but from that point, say out to the continental shelf break, there's an awful lot going on between the terra firma land, as Pierre likes to call it, and the um, and the open ocean. And uh, for a long time, uh, this uh, tran this um, uh, uh, carbon flux between these systems was used by various uh, groups, including uh, the Global Carbon Project and the IPCC. Um, uh, in, their, in their carbon budgeting exercises. And this uh, value here uh, in a paper led by Andy Jacobson in 2007 of 0.45 petagrams of carbon per year has, has been used a lot, and it's sort of based on this kind of single pipe view that the rivers just kind of empty um, carbon into the open ocean. And, of course, we know there's a lot more that goes on there, and there's going to be a, a session later um, in this meeting about uh, one aspect of that, the tidal wetland uh, carbon uh, exchange with, with estuaries and, and uh, subtidal waters. Um, so this value was recently uh, challenged by Lor uh, Respondi in, in a paper, and it was mentioned in, in um, uh, um, uh, Kepler's talk uh, recently. It's to be about 0.8 petagrams of carbon per year. So that's a pretty big difference. And these are, you know, this is a substantial amount of carbon that's moving. We're only talking tenths of, of petagrams up to about a petagram we're talking about a lot of carbon. We need to pay attention to this. And so um, 
So we thought we would basically take a closer look at this. And let me, let me just to connect to, the, um, to the, one of the issues at hand, particularly in this carbon gaps study, um, uh, a study group that, that Galen and Peter led, uh, a big interest in this uh, outgassing um, of several tenths to maybe up to a pedogram of carbon is because, um, because it acts as a um, kind of a correction, if you want, on the, um, on the uh, outgassing estimated by the sort of methods that uh, uh, Peter uh, ha um, has, has led and others, um, in including uh, um, Alizé uh, Ruber. I hope I'm, I'm doing a better job at pronouncing her name, and she's here today, by the way. Uh, but here's one estimate of, of, the, of the outgassing uh, based on her work, and I'm sorry, not of the outgassing, but the, anthro the uptake of anthrogenic carbon by the ocean. And of course, you need to add the natural outgassing to that. And, and I've just taken uh, an average of those two estimates that I just showed, one by uh, Andy Jacobson and the other by Laura Splondy, about 0.6, and added that to, to um, Ruber's uh, um, uh, estimate of, of 1.7 uptake. So that's quite a bit. We're talking about a, an addition of another third um, uh, to, to get the uh, actual Estimate. So this term is, is uh, significant, this uh, sort of natural outgassing term. And, uh, you know, so that was one thing we wanted to address in the study with, with, uh, with Pierre Law and Philippe. And in addition, we wanted to sort of review and synthesize um, uh, the fluxes that are, that are between the land and seas, particularly in this land-ocean aquatic continuum and that goes all the way from, you know, headwaters um, out to the continental shelf break, and there's a lot going on here, and there's sort of two loops that are that are uh, that we'll get, get back to at some point. But this is the large loop that we were just talking about of several tenths of petagrams that are you know, transported from the land to the ocean, outgassed by the ocean, and then taken up again by the land. And of course, there's a lot that goes on in between there, and we wanted to get a get a better handle on what that was. So that was the main objective to quantify with error estimates, this land to ocean carbon transfer and the anthropogenic perturbation, right? Because it's easy for us to, it's relatively easy, it's a difficult problem to begin with, but relatively easy to figure out what's going on now. Uh, and then it's even more, it's much more challenging to, to get back to this sort of natural state. What was the natural outgassing? Because it's been perturbed. So we wanted to get both the um, uh, pr sort of present day state and the uh, perturbation from natural conditions, say uh, a few hundred years ago. And uh, this is a bottom up approach. So it's really, a, it's a very synthetic approach. It's looking at lots of studies, more than a hundred uh, peer reviewed publications. We're synthesizing observational data. We're using statistical and process based models. Uh, sometimes we have to use mass balance because some of these fluxes are just, uh, we just haven't measured them or haven't measured them in sufficient uh, detail that we can get an estimate of the flux at the global scale, so we rely on um, mass balance to to fill that uh, fill that gap. So the overall procedure is to estimate the modern flux, and it's sort of nominally 1990 to the present, but we'll zoom in on this 10-year period when we look at the uh, growth in atmospheric CO2 and fossil fuel emissions to try to put it in uh, uh, a modern perspective. Then we estimate the anthropogenic perturbation. And this is often, uh, we're using models oftentimes to get this perturbation. Sometimes we're just using estimates of the change in area of a system, like tidal wetlands. We don't really know what they were doing. It's hard enough to know what they're doing now. But uh, to estimate what they were doing uh, 200 years ago, we have to sort of uh, estimate how much tidal wetland loss there has been, for example. And then finally, to compute the pre-industrial flux. And that's when we get back to this natural um, outgassing. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of it. It's a very dense and detailed paper, and uh, Pierre really has done a, uh, uh, an incredible job at, at, at pulling all of the information um, together. And here's just one example. And if you go into the uh, gory details and the supplementary information of the paper, you'll see tables like this for each of the fluxes, you know, where, uh, so this is the domain just for the inland water outgassing outgassing from rivers and, and ponds and whatnot. And so, um, so that's the domain. Here are different estimates of the present day flux, some estimate of the, con uh, the confidence, how much it's been, turbed, been perturbed, what's the method, is it a model, is it data-based, is it mass balance, 
what sort of data density, temporal span, spatial resolution, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, it's kind of, we're taking, um, you know, all the information that we can and, and trying to make sense, sense of it. Okay, so here's the outcome of that exercise for the present day, and there's a lot here. Um, I, I, I can't go through it all, uh, but some of the fluxes that are of interest are, um, for example, are you seeing my cursor? Or um, No, you're not, are you? Okay, so we better not do that anymore. Uh, okay, so uh, I thought you were. I thought it was up there. Where did it go? Not there. Okay, anyway, we'll use the pointer then. I can figure out how to use this but I can't figure out how to use this. Okay, that's not good. Okay, we're just not gonna do anything. Just gonna like, hands off. What's that? What? There's a stick. Oh my God, all right, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Old school, all right, here we go. So, um, <laughs> all right, glad you're having fun. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here we go. Here's one of the, the best known Actually, I'm not supposed to wander, right? <laughs> hey, I, you want to, you want, am I okay to wander now or not? Okay. I, okay, right. All right. So here's one of the best known fluxes, which is the, uh, the transfer of carbon, you know, kind of at the head of tide into estuaries. And we, we uh, sort of reevaluated that, and it's close to a pedogram of, uh, of carbon per year. But of course, there's a lot that goes on uh, from that uh, a transfer into um, estuaries. Uh, there's carbon that gets buried in tidal wetlands and estuaries, and much to my chagrin, they were kind of lumped together in this, in this presentation, but I'll peel it apart a little bit later. Um, one thing that's interesting about this is that um, there's, uh, there's, quite a, there's quite a lot of activity going on between, um, between this point here, the head of tide, and the continental shelf break. You can see fluxes on the order of several tenths of, of petagrams of carbon per year, but a lot of them are sort of canceling out. I mean, kind of um, for, I don't know if there's any good reason that it's doing so, but we're ending up with a, a flux to the open ocean at the continental shelf break that's pretty much the same as the flux from the head of tide into, uh, uh, in, into estuaries. In other words, the uptake uh, from the atmosphere is largely balanced by burial in, in estuaries, tidal wetlands, and continental shelf uh, sediments. And we could go upstream here. Um, you can see some of the quantities that are estimated by, by mass balance here, but we can go upstream here and look at some of these fluxes and they're quite large. Um, this flux from terrestrial waters, um, almost three teragrams of, of carbon per year. So there's a lot of interesting terrestrial stuff here, but we want to focus, of course, on the marine aspects of the, um, of the uh, synthesis. So, and, so that's, that's the, the present day, and then these are the estimates of the, of the perturbations, um, which can be substantial uh, in, in, in many cases. And, and so you can see that the, the flux uh, from uh, continental shelf waters to the open ocean has, in, has increased maybe by, by about 10 or 15 uh, percent or so. And uh, of course, the, the sign of the of the air sea flux um, uh, has changed, right? There's a perturbation of uh, in, um, uptake, perturbation of two and a half uh, uh, petagrams of, of carbon per year. Okay, so let's zoom in on some of these open ocean um, carbon budgets because that's sort of uh, one of the purposes of, of participating in the, uh, the carbon gaps, um, carbon gaps uh, working group was trying to get a better uh, estimate of what this um, gap is here, and and this this left-hand panel sort of uh, summarizes it. Um, the pre-industrial uh, flux is about 0.8 uh, petagrams um, of carbon per year at the continental shelf break into the open ocean. About 0.15 is buried, and the remainder, about 0.65, is outcast. So it it does it, it comes in between. Uh, Andy Jacobson and, and, and Laura Splondy's uh, estimate has got an error, uh, two sigma error of about um, uh, 50%. And uh, uh, so th this, is, this is sort of an update of, the, of, of what I showed earlier in the talk. Um, now we can take uh, uh, Rubert's 
um, estimate of the uptake, add the 0.65, uh, put, and, uh, put error estimates on it. Um, we can also um, account for anthropogenic carbon that's kind of coming in sideways, which is something we don't often think about. We think about anthropogenic CO2 just coming in through the ARC interface, but some is actually coming um, uh, through uh, the river network. Of course, there's a big, big error on it, so we're doing our best um, to estimate the, the errors when we can. So what this shows um, is that the ocean is storing more anthropogenic carbon than it gets directly from the atmosphere because it's getting some of this carbon in uh, sideways. And then to go upstream, um, it's even more dramatic. Um, the uh, terrestrial ecosystems uh, store less anthropogenic CO2 than they get directly from the atmosphere. So this is a big um, uh, difference between the uptake, 2.3, and the storage, 1.7. We have this, um, you know, about 30% or so um, is being exported laterally to, uh, to inland waters. So, um, so then we can uh, take, the, uh, take the present day um, fluxes, the anthropogenic uh, perturbation, subtract the two to come up with a pre-industrial carbon cycle. And this is, this is it in all of its um, glory. It's, um, it's including some of these geological fluxes um, on the left uh, are related to weathering. Uh, terrestrial ecosystems do take up a lot of carbon naturally from the atmosphere, almost two petagrams. A lot of that is just transferred to inland waters, and a lot of that is actually outgassed. So that's what, what uh, Pierre refers to as this upstream loop, uh, kind of recycling loop between the atmosphere, terrestrial ecosystems, and uh, inland waters. But a, a substantial part, about not quite a pedogram, gets transported uh, into um, uh, what I would call coastal waters, you know, at the head of tide, um, into estuaries. And um, uh, there's a, a, a fair bit that's buried, right? But there's, and there's also a fair bit that's taken up um, uh, from the atmosphere. And again, there's this kind of uh, constancy of this lateral transfer from the head of tide all the way out to the continental shelf break. So a lot of things are, are canceling out uh, to, to make that uh, flux relatively stable um, uh, to, the, uh, to the open ocean. So we can zoom in on the, the pre-industrial coastal fluxes. I know there's going to be a whole session about this, um, particularly about um, the transfer of uh, carbon. Yeah, these arrows didn't, didn't come out right, so I'm going to step over here. Uh, so what um, what I had shown before was um, 0.2 being up, uh, taken up by tidal wetlands and estuaries. That's really 0.3 being taken up by, by tidal wetlands, mangroves, uh, and marshes, um, minus 0.1 being outgassed by, um, by estuaries. And this is supposed to be a little arrow at the end of this here, and um, that is what the tidal wetland uh, sort of lateral fluxes at the at the global scale. That's what we estimate the the out the outwelling, you know, um, Odom's uh, outwelling of carbon uh, from tidal wetlands to uh, estuaries. A big, you know, 50% error on it. Um, uh, so that's what uh, so that needs to sort of get into the riverine flux. So we normally think of just the rivers sort of emptying carbon into the ocean, but it's also a uh, lateral transfer from tidal wetlands, and here we're showing it to be about 20% uh, of, the, um, 20 of the, the total uh, total input. So that's, uh, those are the main points. Looks like we'll have, have some time uh, to, to get caught up on the schedule here. The pre-industrial land to ocean carbon loop, 0.65 plus or minus 0.3 petagrams of carbon per year, and that's a two sigma error. That's what we estimate from our synthesis. And that loop is reinforced by two smaller loops, that upstream land to inland waters atmosphere loop, and then a downstream, uh, really this should be tidal wetlands. Thank you. No, thank you. This should really be a, um, uh, not just tidal wetlands, but um, uh, uh, continental shelf waters as well, uh, because they take up uh, carbon naturally and uh, transfer that carbon to the, um, to the open ocean. So that's the, sort of the downstream, um, uh, a, a small downstream loop as well. And so ignoring 
these uh, lateral carbon transfers in the, in the land, land ocean aquatic continuum ends up overestimating the anthropogenic um, carbon uptake by land and us underestimating it uh, by the ocean. So that, uh, that will do it. Thanks very much for your uh, attention. So do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, great talk. Um, question with regards to assumptions of the ecosystem makeup of pre-industrial estuary systems. I mean, my understanding is, you know, reef systems in Chesapeake and off Staten Island, these are massive features that would have had a much higher, you know, sea to air flux of carbon back then. So what assumptions are you making about the industrial ecosystem. Yeah, honestly, pretty wild assumptions. I mean, there aren't that many studies. Um, there was one that was uh, led by uh, Pierre Saint Laurent, which I, I co-authored at, at Margie Friedrich's group where we looked at the Chesapeake, um, you know, uh, today, the outgassing today. And, and, and it was a modeling study where we changed the nitrogen inputs. Um, we changed... Um, we, we changed the riverine inputs uh, mostly. I think we also changed sea level rise, the sea level as well, but that didn't have much of an effect. So there's not a lot of studies, as you can imagine, uh, trying to uh, uh, quantify what, uh, what pre-industrial estuaries were doing. Um, I can't remember exactly what we found in that study. I think there was some offsetting effects of the change in nitrogen inputs. Uh, the warming also warming will uh, change the the solubility and and the biogeochemistry as well, um, and also alkalinity uh, DIC and alkalinity fluxes have changed. So, you know, I, I think we ended up um, not changing that. The, our best estimate of the perturbation was zero, but then we had a you know an error that was probably 50% of what the current day outgassing is. So what we didn't know, we tried to put a pretty large error on it and, you know, had to rely on, you know, our own uh, judgment um, at those points. Um, thanks. Uh, Samantha Sedlecki from University of Connecticut. I was just great talk, Ray. Thank um, you, Sam. I, I really appreciate that you're considering the um, organic side of things alongside the carbon yeah. budget important in coastal systems. Um, and I was wondering, you know, it's really challenging to, like, create these um, static views of yeah. systems that are so rapidly changing. Um, if you thought about how some of the arrows might be shifting in response to the rapid warming and the deoxygenation, which may exacerbate some of the processes important to these transfers, in particular of the organic side. Um, and I was wondering if you thought about that in this work and sort of to identify some places where we need to continue to monitor and keep our eyes on, right? Yeah, we certainly thought about it. There hasn't much, there's not much we were able to, to do about it. There are some studies that, that take into account, like the one I mentioned earlier for the, for the estuary. There's been continental shelf um, uh, carbon cycle studies that have looked at, you know, compared pre-industrial times to present times with changing nutrient inputs. There have been studies on land that looked at how erosion has changed in response, you know, to, to human use, damming, things like damming, but also um, to the extent possible changes in the climate. And I don't know to what extent those modeling studies would have captured, for example, changes in extreme events, you know, which we'll hear about. Another good thing we'll hear about um, uh, later this week is about the variability. And, and our study, you know, you know, just barely scratches at the surface of some of these issues of, of variability where I think, you know, single events can really dump a lot of carbon <laughs> into the system and it's hard, uh, hard to, to capture in, in these sort of uh, global mass balance uh, studies. We really need, you know, kind of earth system modeling framework that's got all of this in it and, you know, we bring to bear, just like we were hearing in the earlier talks, we bring to bear you know, a combination of models and data to try to get at some of these issues that are, are not directly measurable. Oh, 
Hi, uh, this is Jessica Luge from GSDL. Thank you. Uh, you started answering portions of my question already, but I was wondering if you can comment on the relative variability of the land carbon sink versus the ocean carbon sink with this new understanding of the lateral carbon transfers. Um, you know, because I mean, just looking at some of the plots shown earlier from the global carbon budget, there's a uh, wide variability in the land carbon sink compared to the ocean carbon sink. And I was just wondering if, yeah, how does this, um, how, how, do you, how do these new understandings affect our understanding of that variability? You're talking about like interannual variability in, in, in carbon uptake by, by the terrestrial biosphere? Yeah, yeah. And how, how does our study kind of um, inform? <laughs> Sorry, it's a challenge. Big question. <laughs> I'm not sure I can speak uh, very intelligently uh, on that. Do you have something you want to say about it? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I guess what I would say, um, given the, the large flux from terrestrial systems to inland waters, I mean, it's really a massive flux. And um, it's also one of the fluxes I, I didn't, uh, uh, pointed out in, in you know, verbally, but it's also one of those fluxes that is quantified by mass balance. So um, maybe I'll, uh, I don't know if I could really answer your question, but I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to say, because people, you know, often want to know what are the things we should be um, working on. And I, I would try to, uh, you know, our, what, what's one benefit of our study is that it, because it gives error estimates and, 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 and sort of best estimates, you can is, is a, uh, a, a means for focusing your attention on, on the unknowns. And those starred quantities that are estimated by mass balance, those are the things that I think at least some part of our community needs to be investigating. So we're not just strictly relying on, um, on uh, mass balance. Okay, so then this is the perfect follow-on question from Joellen Russell. What measurements would be most helpful to reduce the uncertainty in the loop? Are there measurement locations or times of year that would reduce uncertainty the most? Yeah, I mean, I, I, as, as I was alluding to, I, I mean, we're not going to be able to measure the global, globally the flux at the continental shelf break into the open ocean, but we should be doing it in some places, you know, to see if, it, if our kind of simple mass balance assumptions are... Are, uh, worth, are, are working. So that's where I would put attention. Um, one area uh, also is that some of these systems, we don't have good constraints on even the area. So I think we've done, uh, particularly the work by Govan Laruel, he's really done a lot of great work on quantifying estuarine area. I think we're doing a lot better with that. The mangrove folks, I think, have, have, have narrowed the error bars pretty small on, on mangrove area, but salt marsh, uh, area is still pretty um, unknown, and we put pretty wide error bars on it. If we don't even know, you know, what the aerial extent of salt marshes are, then, then you know, we, we really we, we need to we need to do a better better job at that. So those are a few of the areas that I mean I'm kind of interested, so I'm a little biased. Um, and this also this lateral flux for the you know it's not this community necessarily, although some of you may, might be. Um, interested in it, getting this lateral flux from terrestrial systems to inland waters. I mean, it's three petagrams of carbon per, per year, for Christ's sakes. It's like we've got to, you know, and there are some measurements of it, and probably a lot more than I know about, but um, I still feel like it's a pretty poorly uh, constrained aspect of this land-ocean aquatic continuum. There's another question. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a great talk, uh, Ray. Uh, Alec Wang from uh, hey, Alec. Hoi. <laughs> Hi. We'll talk. <laughs> but uh, just quick question. The um, reduction of wetland uh, for the last 100, 150 yeah. years is 50% plus, uh, some maybe more. Right. Uh, in your thesis, do you consider yes. this kind of change? Yep, yep. So, so the, um, the burial... You know, our past, past estimates of burial and tidal wetlands and uptake from the atmosphere are a good bit um, larger than uh, they were for the present day. You can see that in one of the figures. And these are all pretty much right out of the, out of the paper. Any additional questions? 
If not, we will move on with the program. Uh, thank you very much, Ray. Okay, our next talk is uh, going to be by uh, Seth Dushinsky, who unfortunately at the last minute could not make the trip uh, and will be presenting virtually. So that will occur now. And <laughs> Seth is from the uh, University of Hawaii. Okay. Uh, well, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, apologies for not being able to join in person, really. Uh, looking forward to this meeting, and it's a shame, but appreciate everyone's flexibility and uh, willingness to hear a virtual presentation. So I'll be talking to you today about uh, some of what we've learned about the ocean carbon sink from biogeochemical Argo floats. Um, just to give a, a brief outline, uh, I'm going to start off getting us all on the same page about what biogeochemical Argo floats are. I'll talk about how we can estimate PCO2 from float measured pH, talk some about past results, and then uh, look at some recent work and future thoughts. Oops. Okay, so here's our current distribution of uh, biogeochemical floats. This is highlighting oxygen, nitrate, and pH floats. Um, green dots for pH also typically have oxygen and nitrate and floats at uh, uh, are labeled nitrate also have oxygen. So there's a lot more oxygen than there are any other kind of observations. Um, we see a pretty Southern Ocean heavy uh, distribution and that I will, um, uh, as I'll, I'll focus on, the, that's largely due to the Southern Ocean carbon and climate observations and modeling project that has been deploying floats in the Southern Ocean uh, equipped with biogeochemical sensors since 2014. Uh, recently, uh, on the U.S. side of things, the Global Ocean Biogeochemistry Arrays and NSF-funded project to increase uh, biogeochemical float coverage and deploy about 500 floats over the next several years. Um, so there's been a lot of work uh, within the U.S. There's also a ton of international uh, participation. Um, a lot of the oxygen floats throughout the ocean have been uh, deployed by um, other countries and, uh, and starting to get into pH uh, floats as well. So there's a whole lot of uh, working on going on right now. There's also, um, you know, I guess uh, before we get into uh, the PCO2, this is what the floats typically do in the ocean. Um, each profile takes 10 days, spend most of their time at 1,000 meters depth before diving down to 2,000 meters and making measurements back out to the surface, sending data back uh, to land. We get measurements of oxygen, nitrate, and pH, as I mentioned. Also, uh, some floats, most have bio-optics, uh, so fluorescence and backscatter, and now more and more are also measuring photosynthetically available radiation. So not all the floats being deployed have all six of these parameters, but uh, they are increasing in number. Okay, so today's session is focused on the ocean carbon sink. Uh, we can't get the carbonate system without two parameters, and we're only measuring pH. So what have we done? Well, uh, we can estimate PCO2 using the pH measurements and an alkalinity estimate. This is from a multiple linear regression. Um, for instance, the Carter et al. Lyre algorithms. And from the measured pH and alkalinity regressions, we can calculate an estimate of FCO2 and then PCO2. And so again, these are estimates, they're not measurements. They have a theoretical accuracy of around 11 microatmospheres. And if you compare that to shipboard measurements, uh, that the best ones have accuracy of around two to three microatmospheres. So we'll talk a bit about what we can do uh, from floats. So this talk, as I mentioned, is focused on air sea CO2 fluxes. We have lower accuracy than underwater moored observations, but we have good spatial and seasonal coverage. Um, I will not be talking about biological carbon export, which is another aspect of the ocean carbon sink, um, but tomorrow there's a, another plenary uh, looking at our evolving understanding of the biological carbon export, and there's a lot of good posters that uh, use some of these data. I want to highlight uh, my student, Shannon McClish, who has a, a lot of really interesting results looking at uh, NCP in this seasonal sea ice zone, so go check out those posters. 
Okay, so uh, Galen showed some uh, SOCAT measurement uh, distributions earlier. Um, this is a, a figure from uh, Becker all 2016, um, where we have the, the SOCAT measurements in the 2000s broken down by season. And what I want to focus on is the difference between uh, Northern Hemisphere summer, Southern Hemisphere winter, where there's really sparse data, uh, versus Northern Hemisphere summer, uh, where we have a lot of uh, good data. So um, in the, the Southern Hemisphere, in, uh, in, in the summer, we have more measurements than we, the, um, do in the winter, but still uh, not too many. Um, so we've got big gaps in the data set. Um, whether those gaps matter really depends on, on how well we can map um, observations from sparse uh, data. To co contrast what we see from ships and pH equipped floats, uh, this is now shipboard observations over the last decade. I've gridded these into three by four degree grid cells, uh, something closer to the correlation plane scales of carbon in the uh, upper ocean that we care about. And these are looking at the total number of months represented. So if there's 12 here, you're getting a full seasonal cycle sometime during the decade, maybe multiple times during the decade. Um, lots of areas of the ocean, especially in the Southern hemisphere where we don't have a full seasonal cycle. At best, we have a few months over the last decade. If you look at floats, Definitely not nearly the same uh, area covered, but we're starting to get a lot more of these open ocean regions where we have a full annual cycle in some of these grid cells. Um, again, Southern Ocean focused, but starting to get more coverage in the rest of the globe. Uh, and that should fill in as GOBGC gets underway. So what have we learned? Well, I'm gonna uh, talk about sort of two different uh, aspects. One is the Southern Ocean flux magnitude. We'll talk about uh, where we stand with that. And then we also can learn things about the importance of wintertime outcasting or resolving the seasonal cycle. And these are a bit different in that flux magnitude really depends on fleet-wide accuracy. So systemic biases are more of a concern than any noise, right? We care about accuracy, not necessarily precision. If you're looking at large numbers of, of observations uh, distributed evenly, Whereas if we're looking at the seasonal cycle, systemic biases do matter. Uh, but in general, what we've seen is that where we're learning about the seasonal cycle, the magnitude of these seasonal differences between floats and ship only products are larger than our possible biases. So we've got sort of uh, um, added uh, information there regardless of any biases. So if we focus on the Southern Ocean where we have most new information from floats, um, as, as Galen laid out, our contemporary flux is a mix of anthropogenic and natural CO2 fluxes. In the Southern Ocean, the natural flux is uh, largely thought to be a balance between uptake um, in the northern part of the Southern Ocean as subtropical, subtropical waters move south. They cool and you have biological production. Both of these allow uptake of CO2. Uh, opposing that, we have upwelling of deep water leading to outgassing of natural carbon. These two roughly balance so that the contemporary CO2 flux is largely thought to be an overall anthropogenic uptake. And put some numbers on these, contemporary flux is about 1.1 petagrams of carbon per year into the ocean, as thought to be mostly anthropogenic and balanced natural um, uh, uptake. And this figure and those numbers are from the Scrooge et al. 2019 uh, annual review paper. So when the first uh, SOCOM float PCO2 estimates came out, um, we had this initial paper by Allison Gray and co-authors comparing float estimates of uh, air sea fluxes. So shown in these colored bars here, separated into different regions of the Southern Ocean from North to South. And largely driven by this outgassing in the Antarctic Southern Zone, Gray et al. 2018 found an uptake it was near neutral. So petagram of carbon difference, very large change. Um, it's generated a lot of uh, talk, pushback, um, but gave us some of our first idea of where we were learning new things from these floats. Um, this expanded on some initial work by Nancy Williams that found very high uh, delta PCO2 in this polar Antarctic zone that she defined um, from floats relative to uh, what uh, the climatology, so Landshuser Takashi had found before. 
And as I mentioned, this, this disagrees with prior ship-based work that is in large part driven by summertime observations. So to try and reconcile these, we uh, set up to combine the ship and float-based estimates using two interpolation uh, mapping methods, the land tracer neural network that we've heard about um, this morning and, and the Rodenbeck et al. Uh, gain and Carboscope mixed layer interpolation scheme. Uh, these are two methods that are commonly used in, for example, the global carbon budget to um, take our somewhat sparse uh, surface PCO2 observations interpolate and fill gaps and calculate CO2 fluxes directly from observations. And we tested three products, a ship only, a ship and float, and then one that was weighted towards floats as a sensitivity test of where we might get to uh, in the long run. So this is the sort of results that we get where uh, here, this is neural network in the upper row and Yen and Carboscope in the bottom row. We see uh, an increase in the outgassing. These are mean annual fluxes increasing the outgassing uh, in our combined ship and float, our SOCOM plus SOCAT estimate uh, centered around the polar front um, all throughout the ACC. We see this in both products. There are definitely differences in magnitude. Um, overall, it's consistent in the direction and location of the change in the flux uh, that the Great All 2018 study found. Um, I do want to highlight, though, that you know, these differences between the products are important. And I, I think reflect, as I'll talk more about uh, later, that we shouldn't be trusting any single product and, and rather uh, using a suite of different mapping methods makes sense and interpolation and flux products. So where does where did this uh, combined estimate leave us? Well, um, we found a contemporary flux that's about uh, 0.4 petagrams of carbon uh, lower uptake in the Southern Ocean. Um, than previously thought, or than we estimated from the ship only um, data at the same time. And given that we have other independent uh, sources of information to understand what the anthropogenic uptake was, uh, we, um, we thought that this represented a, a change in our understanding of the natural carbon flux uh, toward more outgassing, and outgassing about 0.4 petagrams of carbon per year. Um, and this actually agreed with earlier work by uh, Laura Splondi and co-authors that um, Ray Najjar was, was uh, previously talked about and building on, um, uh, where they also revised the natural carbon flux in the uh, Southern hemisphere due to riparine uh, outflow. So where have we come since then? Um, here I have both the uh, neural network and union carboscope methods. This is now updated for SOCAD v 2021. So through to the end of 2020, and this is looking back over the last uh, 35 years or so. I have the SOCOM and SOCAT, so this are combined ship and float estimates in blue, and our SOCAT only in red for both the neural network and any carboscope. Um, those are in the upper plots with petagrams of carbon per year. Uh, so this is flux into the Southern Ocean south of 35. And then the difference is plotted below. And one of the things that we were first unsure about was if the floats were, say, capturing some interannual variability that was just being missed by recent shipboard years, or whether it represented a sort of net uh, change in the mean flux that had been missing. Um, right now, it seems like this is not uh, necessarily interannual variability. Depending on which product you're looking at, the, the offset between the products, the, the mapped estimates that include the uh, shipboard measurements uh, only, and those that also include the float measurements, is around 0.3 to 0.4 petagrams of carbon per year. And uh, stable, except for some deviations in uh, the anti-carboscope method, which seems to respond more quickly to any uh, short-term interannual inter variability. If we look at the seasonal cycle. These are our five Southern Ocean regions plus the total Southern Ocean south of 35 south. Um, and so from uh, north going south here, we can go from 2017. So the, this is a, the product in 2018, which went through 2017. We can look here and then switch to the 2020 product. Um, overall, we see, I'll just go back and forth a little bit. We don't see much of a uh, huge change. The differences where we see them primarily in this Antarctic Southern zone and polar frontal zone are fairly consistent. Um, so we're not seeing some large uh, jumps. 
there were some initial very high PCO2 uh, data, but overall it seems fairly consistent that we are, are maintaining this difference where we see more outgassing in this region around the polar front. And if we look at a 2015 to 2020 average for our contemporary Southern Ocean flux, we get about the, you know, definitely within the error, uh, negative 0.78 petagrams of carbon per year um, for the last six years, as opposed to the original three years. So we are, um, we'll be updating uh, combined data sets and adding them to NCEI um, so that if other folks want to use these, uh, they can. And as we get more pH equipped floats, um, we'll start looking at doing this globally and not just adding floats from the Southern Ocean. Um, depending on where the floats are, we may or may not learn new things about the, uh, the seasonal cycle, um, but that will also be a, a good test as we have more floats in regions where we also have a better uh, handle on the uh, shipboard, uh, on the seasonal cycle from shipboard observations. So that, that'll be great. All right. so. One thing that has come up uh, time and again, and that I want to talk about, are how well do float PCO2 and flux estimates agree with other observations and other uh, flux uh, estimates from, from different sources of observations. So there's a few ways you can uh, look at how well the, the floats are doing. You can look at regional comparisons, uh, whether they agree across the seasonal cycle where we have both uh, floats and ships, which they seem to. Uh, where they disagree is, is where we don't have a lot of ship observations in the winter. Um, for time, I'm not going to uh, show these figures, but I will talk a little bit about our one-to-one -one comparisons, our crossover comparisons, where we see pretty good agreement. And then I'll uh, talk about some other flux estimates and uh, PCO2 comparisons from other groups. So uh, past comparisons with uh, float PCO2 found that there might be a bias at high of about two to four microatmospheres looking at, at crossovers between ships and floats. I've updated this uh, for 20, uh, through 2021. This now is our SOCAT PCO2 measurements uh, in, on the x-axis, float PCO2 estimates on the y-axis, uh, one to one line is in black, and these dashed lines are plus or minus 10 microatmospheres. This histogram on the right shows the differences. These are now SOCAT minus Argo. And overall, we see mean difference of about two microatmospheres, negative 1.8 microatmospheres uh, with a large spread, 15 microatmospheres spread. Um, centered around zero nicely. There are some, a few of these floats here uh, that seem to be um, high and a few that are low. So this. It's a pretty good indication that we don't have a very large um, systemic bias. It's certainly not within that uh, original uncertainty estimate uh, from Nancy Williams of uh, plus or minus 11 microatmospheres. Um, but there's also enough of a spread here and not that many crossovers. So you know, we're still, this is something to keep an eye on. There have been a number of other comparison studies that have tried to uh, estimate whether or not floats are getting things right. Uh, most recently, there's this uh, Wu et al. paper that came out earlier this year, and they looked at delta CO2 disequilibrium relative to delta O2 disequilibrium. Uh, using shipboard data, they found what they uh, believed was a, a consistent and robust relationship, and then compared that to float uh, data and found uh, what they think is a bias of about 5.8 microatmospheres, uh, with floats being high. Um, other studies have comparisons. Adrian Sutton, uh, who we'll hear from next, has uh, done some comparisons with uh, sail drones and floats. Um, and there's a paper by uh, McKay et al. in 2021, where they find a similar bias magnitude as, as the Wu et al. paper, um, using a different approach looking at um, summertime profiles of DIC and trying to estimate what the wintertime DIC and uh, uh, pH would have been um, the year before and compare that to floats. Uh, there's also this paper by Matt Long and co-authors from last year where they used aircraft observations and atmospheric inversion estimates to uh, calculate the CO2 flux south of 45 south. Uh, reproduced their um, flux, the seasonal cycle fluxes here in black, that's the long L estimate. And they uh, spent, uh, they, they focused on the comparison between the uh, float the shipboard estimates, uh, the float and shipboard estimates in the wintertime. And they see a, a pretty big difference in the seasonal outgassing magnitude. 
Um, although once you start adding in error bars, you know there's a fair amount of overlap there. Um, but they have good agreement in the winter time with shipboard and uh, their aircraft-based estimate that is lower than the outgassing that we see from the floats. However, if you look at the summertime, they see much stronger uptake than you get from either the floats uh, and ships together in our combined product or from uh, the ship only estimate. So, you know, I think it's overall, I'd say it's great that we have all these different groups comparing uh, estimates. And I think that is exactly what we need. Um, but oh, I'm becoming pretty convinced that we don't want to trust any one estimate. Um, and I think we need to try and find out the right way to take all the strengths of our different products and estimates and combine them uh, so that we, we can either come closer to the truth or come closer to a, a better understanding of the uncertainty. So it seems like we do have some possible bias in the float data between one and six micro atmospheres. Um, that's been pretty consistent from early on. Um, there are groups looking uh, into that. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and I think overall, our Southern Ocean flux estimate uncertainty uh, is just, it's higher than we would like, uh, regardless of what method and possibly higher than we've been acknowledging. So I think that's something that we need to address and deal with. Uh, so looking ahead, um, I think what we can do right now is we can continue to explore uh, new seasonal observations in regions where we previously had little data. Uh, seasonal cycle gives us a very good look into mechanistic understanding how well do we understand I think how well we understand the seasonal cycle and the changes throughout the seasonal cycle gives us a good idea of, of how well we understand the mechanisms that combine to give us our surface PCO2. Um, I think there's also gonna be a lot of work connecting surface fluxes to the subsurface signals because I've been focusing here on just our surface PCO2 and air sea fluxes from the upper ocean measurements. But the beauty of floats is we have this full profile and we can connect what uh, is measured in the subsurface carbon system to the surface. Um, so some examples of uh, work that is coming out. Recent paper by Channing Prend, uh, looking at controls on the boundary between thermally and non-thermally driven PCO2. So what you can do when you have full seasonal cycles of a carbonate system uh, from multiple locations uh, across fronts in the Southern Ocean. Um, Channing uh, has, a, I believe other work in review looking at uh, understanding how uh, differences in upwelling combine to give uh, different zonal um, fluxes in the Southern Ocean. And Heidi Chen also has work in review looking at the upwelling of high carbon water and how that will lead to outgassing. Um, I've got a paper in review with Ivana Sarevechki looking at subarctic mode water formation. So this is an example where uh, you know, we now have float observations in these very inaccessible regions for wintertime where important water masses form. So we know subanarch mode water takes up a lot of anthropogenic carbon, but our understanding of how and why it does that really comes from models. So here we're starting to actually have wintertime observations uh, where we can look at, say, what the delta PCO2 is in this water and understand whether it's participating in the contemporary uptake of CO2. And this gives us validation data uh, to understand how these waters take up anthrogenic carbon as well. Um, and this is an example of where the, the differences between the float and ships are significant and much larger than uh, at least any current estimates of bias. So these are float uh, delta PCO2, there's a large spread. We're capturing a very large uh, region of um, subanthropic mode water formation, but these delta PCO2 differences between the floats and the ships are on the order of, say, 20 microatmospheres or so, so well outside of our, our possible uncertainties. Um, and uh, I am actually looking for a postdoc for this project funded by NASA. Uh, so if you're in the market for a postdoc, let me know. Uh, long term, I think we just need to be on the lookout for systemic biases and float estimates. Um, there, the OXIF, the Ocean Carbonate System in a Comparison Form, is working to resolve uncertainties in the pH that goes into our PCO2 estimates uh, with an eye toward improving PCO2 estimates, it is entirely possible that we have um, offsetting errors that are giving us pretty good PCO2, uh, but there's a lot that we don't understand. You know, We're sort of at the cutting edge of what we can do with pH uh, measurements and estimates for flows. 
Um, and so uh, look, be on the lookout for some more uh, work coming out of that working group soon. I think we need to make sure to uh, try and use our observational data sets to the best of their respective strengths. So SOCAT has high absolute accuracy, uh, good temporal, you know, long time history, but not always the best seasonal uh, or spatial coverage. Both, we can start getting seasonal and spatial uh, coverage and variability, um, but obviously there are some downsides we're estimating not measuring PCO2. Uh, sail drones, high resolution for now, regional, uh, those I think have a good potential to fill in a lot of the gaps between ships and floats. Um, I do want to note that you know we do need these times and locations. Uh, we are we found in modeling studies, so in our paper and uh, in a much more comprehensive paper by uh, Plug in all 2021, that adding float uh, observation times and locations really reduces flux uncertainty in model recreations. Um, and so you know we can look at a sort of time and space diagram to think about how adding float observation can help us sample uh, different things. You know, we're talking about air-sea CO2 exchange, this giant gray bubble here. Um, if we think about what floats can add in uh, observing, you know, time, we can start getting to um, lower, smaller space scales using profiling floats. We can also start getting to, to higher resolution seasonal cycles from floats. Uh, some of these space and time areas can be sampled from ships but it's hard to do that in a consistent long-term manner. And so overall, as I said before, I think we need to be using multiple products, look for areas of agreement and try and understand where we have differences, um, working to add more map products to combine uh, float and shipboard data sets. So if you uh, have a mapping method and want to add float data, please get in touch. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank the funding agencies that are funding all of this float work and observational interpretation. Uh, SOCOM has done a lot of hard work in getting these floats out and uh, getting these TCO2 estimates as good as they can. SOCAT, obviously we would be totally lost without this long-term shipboard observational data set. And we, we are uh, in no way trying to replace that with floats as we just need to supplement in times and, and places where the SOCAT database can't go. Um, and then looking ahead, we've got GoBGC, and I think that's really going to revolutionize a lot of uh, what we can do from our observational understanding. So I will go uh, leave my conclusions back up and be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, questions from the audience here? And uh, yeah, when you ask a question, tell us who you are for everyone online and in the room. So, Brendan. Hi, everyone. Uh, Brendan Carter from the University of Washington. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Seth. i um, really curious, do you think when the global array gets built, I'm going to be very positive and assume that it's just going to happen, um, do you think that we're going to start to see similar kind of disagreements in all of the other regions, or do you think that some of the disagreements between the methods are really just unique to the challenges of the Southern Ocean? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of the challenges are, I'm not sure I'd say unique to the Southern Ocean, but the Southern Ocean definitely presents a, a very difficult region, both because of its inaccessibility, but also because of the the there's strong gradients across fronts. Uh, you have very strong seasonal upwelling uh, and formation of water masses that, that subduct water. And I think there's a lot of complex processes going on in a very uh, relatively small area. Um, when we did the uh, model uh, subsampling analysis, looking at flow data areas where the, um, at least the neural network ha had most trouble were areas like the Kershaw extension region, where again, you've got mode water formation um, that, and these strong frontal gradients that I think are difficult to capture in these monthly, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, high resolution, but, but somewhat coarse estimates. So I think um, areas where, where you see where, where it's more difficult for the, where you have a larger sort of um, sample space of, of different carbonate system parameters relative to whatever inputs you have uh, for these mapping methods. I think that's where you're going to see um, new insights. That said, I'm pretty curious about some of the open ocean regions where you know, maybe you don't have a strong seasonal cycle and maybe you don't have a, uh, 
uh, really strong flux, but they're large areas and maybe not as well sampled as we think. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what we learn. Do we have any questions online, Heather? Oh, great. I see one here. Remember to tell us who you are. Uh, thank you. He Lee from University of Delaware, Dr. Reading Test Group. Um, I'm kind of interested in, um, so for the ship-based data or the flow-based data, sometimes they have concentrated in one season. So when you estimate anthropogenic carbon, like if you really only use the data from one season, how biased it can be? Do you have like any ideas about that? Like if we only use summer data, it's like overestimated, like to which direction and how much it is. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. So most of the anthropogenic carbon estimates uh, don't come from direct air-sea flux estimates. Um, in part, just it, you know, it'd be difficult to disentangle the natural uh, and anthropogenic fluxes. So a lot of the of our best understanding of anthropogenic uptake comes from ocean interior measurements and seeing you know, which water masses accumulate anthropogenic carbon and how much, um, or modeling studies. So for the accumulation, you know, the seasonal biases should be less important. Um, and that's in large part why when we change what we thought uh, as the contemporary sub and ocean flux, um, we interpreted that as a, as a change in the natural carbon flux, not the anthropogenic carbon flux. So overall, I think we're learning more about the contemporary and, and natural carbon flux by, uh, by difference um, rather than the anthropogenic but I think we will start to learn more uh, about you know, where the ocean is taking up carbon as we uh, improve, for instance, you know, using like Lady Kepler's um, interior ocean DIC estimates. And as, as we can incorporate flow data, we'll learn at a finer resolution where the ocean is taking up a lot of carbon. And then also I think we can get at the anthropogenic carbon as well. Okay, thank you very much, Seth. Thank you everyone for your questions. We're gonna move on to the final speaker of this session, who is Adrian Sutton from NOAA PML. Do you have a mic, Adrian? Okay, let's get that. And Adrian is going to be uh, talking about applying new observing technologies to reduce uncertainty of ocean CO2 uptake. Ooh, and there I am. <laughs> Hello, myself. <laughs> So Okay, so uh, once we get the slides up, uh, Adrian will be looking towards the future of how we close some of these gaps uh, and where our new observing technologies are going. So um, looking forward to hearing your presentation. Hi, everyone. It's good to see um, half of your faces here, um, better than faces on my computer screen. Um, I am an oceanographer at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle, and I'll be talking about uncrewed surface vehicles, USVs, or we call them autonomous surface vehicles, um, and how we can apply them to uh, uh, filling gaps in our TCO2 uh, observing network. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we may um, ideally sample with these um, USVs. I had a really nasty, like, sinus respiratory combo a few weeks ago, and I have my tea up here and a lozenge, and I'm hoping I don't cough into the mic for people, but um, I'm not contagious. But hopefully we'll, we'll get through this all right. So um, many, many people have been involved in this work um, on our autonomous surface vehicle seat. CO2 technology from our science team at PMEL to our engineering group at PMEL. Um, we also had early, um, uh, early adopters, so to speak, and, and um, those that tested a lot of prototypes and different versions of this sensor that were at um, CSIRO in Australia and CSIR in South Africa. 
I think it's really telling that the two research institutes that we partnered with early on are from the Southern Hemisphere. I'll talk a bit, I mean, we've talked about this this morning, but I'll talk a bit more about the Southern Hemisphere issue. Um, we also worked with a lot of engineers at, within industry, so this is definitely a, a multi-pronged partnership with the U.S. federal um, scientists and engineers and industry and academia. And then I just want to thank some other early adopters of our technology. Um, I think Sarah and Jamie are here. I'm not sure if um, any, anyone else is, but um, they can also answer lots of questions about um, the SAIL drone. And then I just want to acknowledge the funding, um, the parts of NOAA that funded the, the NOAA side of this work. Um, and then at the end, so uh, I'll start the talk primarily just talking about the technology, um, orienting you to that, and I'm going to end with talking so about some model-based approaches for figuring out how we can um, technologies within the observing system, and I'll talk, talk about those collaborators then. So a big focus of ours was to develop technology that could feed um, direct measurements of surface ocean PCO2 observations into this already established value chain, where direct observations of CO2 are incorporated into the SOCAT product, which has been brought up many times this morning and then used to develop those, those global estimates um, of CO2 flux that then inform regular climate assessments, which then inform policy. One of those climate assessments um, is the annual global carbon budget. Galen did a great job of introducing um, both of these um, figures I'm going to show here. Um, so I don't need to do a lot of work there. So you have the um, whole entire global carbon budget on the left with sources and sinks, and then you have um, the ocean component of that, the ocean sink on the right. Um, and we have a couple challenges with this budget. Galen mentioned the challenge that the database estimates of CO2 and the model-based estimates of surface ocean CO2 and the flux are diverging, um, especially within you know, the last about 10 years. And the overall uncertainty in this thing, so that three plus or minus 0.4 gigatons of carbon per year was the last estimate in the, in the last global carbon budget release. And the uncertainty is really too large for us to understand anything less than decadal scale variability in this budget. We can't really get at year-to-year -year variability. Policy does not typically happen at 10-year scale. It happens at much more rapid pace. And as governments and industries invest more in climate mitigation, um, invest more in CO2 removal technologies, invest more in carbon markets, they're going to want to understand whether they're getting a return on their investment, so to speak. And if we don't understand how the ocean is, sink is changing on that time scale, we're in trouble. Um, this, you know, this has also been introduced this morning, and I, it's great that Galen showed an example of one month in SOCAT Seth showed an example of 10 years in SOCAT, and I'm showing an example of one year in SOCAT. So you got all the different time scales here. Um, so, you know, I'd argue that we need to address the uncertainty in this budget at all, all levels, within the models, within the products, um, and also with, uh, in terms of filling uh, observing gaps. Because our surface ocean um, PCO2 network has primarily been opportunistic, um, where, where ships of opportunity are moving goods between continents, primarily in the northern hemisphere, where the bulk of the oceanographic research capacity is in the northern hemisphere. Um, we basically have a system that's very northern hemisphere biased, 
And you can also see this in the location of the buoys. The buoys are the squares on, on this map, and they're all very much biased in the northern hemisphere. So we have a network that has persistent, that's persistent spatial gap and um, also temporal gaps during the winter. So in order to fill these gaps, so I can show you the winter. Here's your time scale of one year of winter, northern hemisphere on the top, southern hemisphere on the bottom. So we've been on a mission to find autonomous platforms that can go where ships don't and have capacity to do basin scale missions and survive big storms at sea. Back when we started this work, there were really only a few USVs that were available outside of the defense sector. There's a lot in the defense sector. Um, these are now, um, you know, there's much more now that's available to us, and these are a, a bunch of those examples. Um, when we started, we started working on the wave glider in the middle and then the sail drone, which is, which is also in the middle. So those are the two I'll talk about today. I'm giving a talk Thursday also, where I'll talk more about, broadly about the different capabilities of these platforms. So the CO2 measurement method we're using on these USVs is similar to how um, much of the work is done on ships. So on buoys and on ASVs, we bubble a sample of air in an equilibrator directly in the seawater for 10 minutes. During that 10 minutes, the, that air sample equilibrates with the CO2 concentration in seawater. There's a demonstration of that um, equilibrator in that video. After that equilibration, we then pull the air inside of the sensor that goes through a, a common inference infrared sensor that measures CO2, um, and we also take an air sample. So we are measuring air and seawater CO2 on these platforms. And they're all deployed with CO2 reference gases, so they're calibrated in situ before and after the measurement, before the measurement. So the buoy-based CO2 system was additionally, or initially developed at Ambari in the 90s. So this technology has been around for a while. EMEL adapted that technology um, and started deploying them on buoys just about two decades ago when Chris Sabine was leading the project before I was um, at PMEL. And when I came to PMEL, we had just started to modify these CO2 systems for use on wave gliders that you're seeing uh, in this video and these, these photos. So we had two early versions of the wave glider that you're seeing in the video, and they are about surfboard size, roughly. Um, they have now um, liquid robotics. Those are now obsolete, and those two actually don't exist anymore. Well, they exist at the bottom of the ocean somewhere, but um, they don't exist with us. Um, this, the current version of the wave glider is larger. It's like paddleboard size. And our colleagues at um, Jupiter Research Foundation and, and CSIR have been um, deploying uh, ASV, versions of ASV CO2 systems on these new, new uh, gliders as well. And the wave glider worked really well for us, particularly in coastal systems and in a few open ocean applications. Um, but we really wanted more basin scale capabilities for observing. Um, and we started partnering with Sail Drone early on because we thought they had that capacity. And so our role at PMEL was really to um, uh, evaluate the sensor quality on those USVs and to integrate new sensors like the ASV CO2. Um, we've worked with Sail Drone through many different iterations of their platform. Um, the photo at the very top is the type of sail drone that's used in most ocean conditions. Um, it's seven meters long, five meters tall, so this is a large platform. Um, early on in our Southern Ocean test, we sent one of those to the Southern Ocean, and Mother Nature suggested we should make the wing smaller. <laughs> so 
uh, sail drum took that suggestion to heart. And the uh, photo in the middle is a photo of the USDs that were first to navigate all the way around Antarctica. Um, they ran into an iceberg and had other dramas, but they survived. Um, and then those are now obsolete. We no longer use those wings, but the one at the bottom is this new shorter wing that is that went through a hurricane, right through the center of a hurricane last summer and is being used in those high wind conditions and high sea conditions where the sail drone is getting rolled by massive waves, which is what happened to the one that had a little boo-boo. Um, so we've had the ASV CO2 on a couple dozen of these sail drone missions in a variety of environments, coastal and open ocean data from all of these missions are archived um, at NCEI, and they started to be a part of SOCAT about uh, two years ago. So if you're using SOCAT data, you're, you're using data from these USVs. So I wanted to give a quick review of papers that have come out from these CO2 missions, and there's a lot more work out there, not enough for me to um, really really go over in this talk, but if you're interested more in the methodology and how we quantified um, measurement uh, uncertainty, you'll want to check out this paper led by Krista Bein. Um, because the ASD CO2 measures both air and seawater CO2, and because the sail drone also measures wind, um, we were able to do some really nice comparisons understanding how um, the, how diff using different data products like wind products or different air uh, CO2 products impact the uncertainty of the CO2 flux measurements. And this is, not, um, this is not new information. A lot of people have been kind of like beating this drum the last few years. But the choice of your wind speed product really matters. And comparing two different CO2 fluxes with two different wind speed products is uh, not a well-controlled um, comparison. In another study led by um, scientists at CSIR, um, they used surface and upper ocean measurements to show that storm-driven outgassing in the Southern Ocean is common, but it's very ephemeral. However, even though it is ephemeral, um, these storms do play a role in the longer term uh, dynamics of uh, ocean physics and, and carbon and that connection in the Southern Ocean. So storms um, cannot be ignored. Um, and our URI partners have been collecting really much needed measurements during winter time in the Gulf Stream when CO2 uptake is really strong. Um, and where we're really lacking a lot of observing. So there's some really nice papers out there. So can these USVs help to reduce our uncertainty in the ocean CO2 sink? And if so, what should that network look like? Two caveats before I dive into that. Um, and, and Seth kind of was, um, was, was giving this message to is that I here I'm focusing on a really narrow research topic, right? And just talking about the ocean CO2 uptake and reducing the uncertainty. Um, but we need a variety of observing platforms and techniques to answer all the questions we have about ocean carbon. There's no one platform that can tell us everything, and we need that multi um, platform strategy. Second, these large autonomous platforms are not cheap technology. And building out a USC network will not happen without additional investments in, in ocean carbon observing, for sure. But as I mentioned earlier, those investments could provide climate information at the time scale that policymakers need. And the observing estimates we really need pale in comparison um, to the future carbon market. And there's one example that um, shows kind of the scale that uh, we're dealing with here. So here's that, that ocean carbon budget on the left um, in 
gigatons of CO2 per year. It's a little different than what I showed earlier. So, and a, a key pathway to stabilizing climate under 2 degrees C involves deploying climate carbon um, dioxide removal technologies or net emission uh, technology, negative emission technologies. And estimates suggest that by 2050, we need to be removing about 10 gigatons of CO2 per year, which is equal to today's CO2 sink. And we have to double that by 2100. In order to get there in 2050, starting in 2030, which is seven and a half years from now, we have to be building hundreds of carbon capture and storage facilities per year. That's the scale of the problem. It's just immense. It just boggles my mind. And if we're going to make that kind of investment on a global scale, we have got to invest in better understanding the ocean CO2 sink. Um, so, Galen did a really great um, introduction of this, which helped me a lot, so thank you. Um, Galen and um, Val Bennington have been working on uh, uh, looking at idealized sampling for, for sail drone USDs using the large ensemble test bed that she talked about early this morning. So just a reminder of how these reconstructions are done using SOCAT is um, you take sparse observations, you develop relationships with, with satellite-based observations that you have good global coverage, and then you come up with this surface seawater uh, CO2 maps that you can calculate CO2 flux with. And then um, Galen presented this before. Um, so we can, so in this method, we can perform those PCO2 reconstructions in a similar way, but by subsampling uh, the models according to different observing scenarios and comparing how the results differ. Um, so that you can read more about that in, in the, the paper from 2021 that was already mentioned. So the preliminary work by, by Val and Galen that has been done focusing on the USD data um, includes a slightly different way to reconstruct the PCO2 than, than the paper from 2021, but it's, it's So these figures show the Southern Ocean from 40 degrees south with longitude on the x-axis, and they show the ensemble mean difference between model PCO2 and reconstruction, uh, reconstructions of PCO2 based on scenarios that don't have USD data on the top versus reconstructions with USD data on the bottom. So when you add the USD data, the bias reduces significantly over most of the region, um, reversing the bias signal in parts of the Atlantic and Indian Ocean se sectors. Um, but note these scales are a bit different, plus or minus nine on top, plus or minus six on the bottom. Here's a scenario where the sail drone USV observations were repeated for five years um, instead of just one. And so the bias without the USV data is on the top and with one plot for each season. And the bias after adding the USV data are on the bottom. And note again, here the scales are different. The top panels plus or minus 22, bottom panels are plus or minus six. And the winter, panels are here um, on the bottom for with USV data and here without USV data. So again, there is a significant reduction in the bias when you add those five years of repeated sampling. And then we can also look at how USV sampling impacts reconstruction, reconstructed PCO2 over time. Um, so again, this is without the sail drone USB data on the top, with it on the bottom, and def definite improvements within that five years sampling repeated uh, um, section, but even improvements just before, presumably because that added sampling told us something about the relationships with the other parameters that improved our, our previous measurements. 
So there's, other bits, there's also been some modeling studies that suggest um, time and space scales that we need to measure in the Southern Ocean. And I took that information to sail drone. I said, okay, if we need to measure at these time and space scales, what would a USV network look like in the Southern Ocean? And it would basically be four USVs operating uh, continuously um, along those blue lines from 40 south basically to 55 south. It's kind of the max uh, south that the sail drones can go. Um, uh, and yeah, getting some, uh, being a little different than our first USV mission where we just basically went straight around, um, these missions would get more of the north-south gradient. I'm going to skip over this one. Um, <clears throat> So I don't think that this is just a southern ocean problem. I think this is a problem in, in other areas of the, the southern hemisphere. And one of those places is a big portion of the South Pacific gyre that tends to fall outside of the, the cargo vessel routes and also has a bunch of island easies that are a little bit of a pain to navigate around. So we end up with this observing gap. Um, so when those wave gliders we had were going obsolete and we weren't going to be able to navigate them anymore because the navigation software was going obsolete, we decided to send it one on uh, last mission to this hole, um, observing hole in the South Pacific. And it ended up taking great observations there for 550 days. So we ended up filling this, this gap. Um, and Dave Monroe at University of Colorado Boulder and some other folks are working on uh, recreating a new Takahashi uh, CO2 climatology. And what I find really astonish astonishing is that when they um, include those measurements in this huge data set of 30 million measurements, the CO2 flux climatology changed by 5%. And I think that just really shows that there's some stuff that we don't know, and we uh, there's a lot of promise in going to measure in these places. So I just want to end quickly talking about gaps because our um, our working group was about gaps, and this figure shows um, basically the science to knowledge framework within ocean carbon research, going from collecting observations to understanding processes to informing climate assessments and policies. And within that value chain um, that I showed at the beginning, one of the, the big gaps um, is that we really lack a coordinated governing body that will allow us to bring together strategies for CO2 observing. Um, there's no, there's, there's no, this has been an op uh, opportunistic network, so there has not been a strategy there. And um, IOCCP and the G7 Future of the Seas and Oceans Initiative are working together to fill in that gap. And then there's also not a USC network in GOOSE. And the Observing Air Sea Interaction Strategy, OASIS, which is a multidisciplinary effort with under the UN decade. Um, is, is starting to uh, coordinate what a USD network may look like. Um, so I'm out of time and I'll just leave there. Um, that gives you a silly picture, but it gives you a good scale of um, how big those things are. Thanks. Thanks so much, Adrian, for showing us the way forward. It's really exciting. Uh, do we have questions? Okay, yes, one online. So we've got a question from Lynn Talley for Adrian. How do you see the globally growing BGC Argo data set fitting into the air sea flux mapping? We realize there are there may currently be biases, but those should likely improve as the data are incorporated in global mapping. The floats also provide interior observations that will constrain air sea fluxes as is already done in state estimation for heat and freshwater fluxes. 
Yeah, great question. I mean, they, we need to understand those systematic biases. I, just for scale, within the community that measures PCO2 directly, we squabble about biases of 0.5. And if we're, if we are, um, you know, within the floats, if we have questions of biases between one and six, um, we really need to nail that down. Um, but there is so much pro pr promise in combining those surface measurements and subsurface measurements for asking so many of the other questions we have. Um, again, in this final slide, my first point is about urgency. And that's why we were so focused on how can we develop technology that we can plug right into that you know, value train, chain right now. And that's what we're, we're doing. But I think on the long run, there's, there's a lot of promise in that. Got another one. OK, go for it, Heather. Uh, from Joellen Russell, Argo operates in territorial waters with an automated notification. How do these other platforms, including SailDrone, handle permission to operate in territorial waters? Given the diversity of platforms, is there a plan for handling permissions and for developing robust global data assembly centers? Yeah, that is such a big problem. There is such a diversity of, of USVs now. I think sail drone and wave gliders are pretty much far along. Like if you do a web of science search for sail drones and wave gliders, you'll get you know hundreds of papers. But um, for any of the other systems, they're really quite new. But they are coming on the scene. And that's part of where I think OASIS is going to help uh, put, put all of that together to make sure that um, those USVs are comparable, that there is a data assembly center, that it has all of those features of a network, because right now it is just a lot of pilot projects. Okay, last call for questions, and then we're going to have, all right, people are getting hungry. We are going to have a bit of a panel discussion here. I know Jorge online has a burning question, and maybe others have sort of more integrated question. How much time do we have for the panel, Heather? We have like, um, should be about uh, 15 minutes or so so we can get to lunch. Yeah? So the speakers for the session could please uh, come to a chair, please. Okay. From Jorge Sarmiento, aren't there also potential biases in other methods for estimating PCO2? You seem to assign all biases to float. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, Seth. I didn't okay. know you were there. <laughs> yeah, um, voice from the sky. So, yeah, I definitely, it depends what you're talking about, because comparing the float PCO2 to shipboard PCO2, I think, um, you know, we, we are pretty, we do have a lot more confidence in the shipboard PCO2 measurements than the float estimates. Um, as far as the uh, Differences, for instance, the Wu et al. paper. You know, there's a lot of assumptions that go into those comparisons. So, no, there I don't, I don't necessarily um, trust that estimate over uh, the flow of estimates. But you know, we want to look at this from a number of different angles and not just trust anything. So, I think, I think bringing in, you know, oxygen is a great, great idea to help constrain the, the CO2. Looking at atmospheric measurements to constrain ocean observations. All these things, especially when you bring in. Uh, estimates that have different uncertainties that aren't necessarily correlated. Uh, I think that's that's a way forward. We just have to appreciate the, the differences and try and understand them. I would uh, like to add something there. Um, it's not only that the, the different biases between the different uh, the different measurements. It's also a question of um, well, let, let me put it that way. If we don't have float observations in the Southern Ocean, I mean, you've seen the map from, from Galen, pretty much this half of the Southern Hemisphere is not covered. So what we do is, at the moment, when we just take shipboard observations, we uh, inter interpolate two, 3,000 miles into the open. Or maybe, yeah, well, probably yes, yeah. So the question is not so much, oh, do the floats have five, six, seven, eight microatmosphere of bias, but rather, isn't 10 microatmosphere bias better or less uncertain than just uh, interpolating like several thousand miles into the open? And sort of this is this is for me the the, the, 
best argument to integrate both shipboard and float observation. Heather, yeah. I've got another one for Liddy or anyone. This is from Bob Anderson. If most ocean uptake of DIC is anthropogenic and not natural, how does this conclusion translate to mechanism? For example, reaction of CO2 plus carbonate equals to bicarbonate versus the biological pump. I don't know if I 100% understand the question, but um, I guess what I was only looking at was now the trend in the natural carbon. So we still have the background natural cycle um, happening. <laughs> There's a lot of natural carbon going in and out, but it's with the purely natural in a steady state, that's not changing. So we've, we're ignoring that basically. So I hope it's that, is that answering the question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, can I just add there? I mean, I think the, the fact that the anthropogenic perturbation is a few percent on top of this huge background, the assumption is, and seems to hold pretty well, that we're not changing that background by this anthropogenic perturbation. Yet, of course, if we look out 50 years from now, the factor changes will be happening, and then those are things that have to also be taken into account. But we don't have evidence that it has changed significantly to date, nor do we have evidence that the biological pump has changed significantly to date. It doesn't mean that it hasn't, and it doesn't mean that it won't, but we certainly don't have observations to conclude that it has such that it should be included in the anthropogenic carbon sink estimates, right? Um, clearly, we need to, and we'll be talking a lot about that this week, which is great, but, but to date, the estimates of the anthropogenic sink assume a steady state, um, by design, assume a steady state biological pump. Uh, hello, I'm Zach Erickson, NOAA PMEL. I have a question that's based on Adrian's motivation, but it's for everyone. In your motivation, you said that one of the big things that you wanted to do was provide um, data at a time scale that informs policy and very much sub-decadal, maybe seasonal. I'm wondering how much we understand how internal variability affects CO2 uptake and basically whether or not if we are able to provide these observations at yearly or sub-yearly time scales, will we understand how much is due to interannual variability versus, you know, human impacts. I mean, so when I think about that question, uh, I thought about interannual variability like my whole, my whole career, uh, and, uh, but it came in, a, in the last couple of years come to understand that the, the variability in the sink to first order is dominated by the PCO2 growth rate in the atmosphere. That's the dominant driver. Uh, and uh, we can see those changes um, you can, you can make very back of the envelope calculations and calculate much of the interannual variability. So that's a big part of it. And, and that's really just because we're, we're just perturbing the system so enormously. I mean, over the pre-industrial background, the atmosphere is 40% higher than it was, right? And so that's like I said, just Henry's law driving carbon into the ocean. On top of that, that force signal, how much internal variability is happening? That's something we're really still struggling to understand. We know ENSO is a big part of it. But there's this Southern Ocean decadal variability that Peter wrote about in his 2015 paper that my group has looked at. It's definitely there and it's persistent and we don't have good um, uh, mechanistic understanding of what that's coming from. Now, is it that the decadal variability is overestimated by all these products? That might be part of the story. Is it that the internal variability, the spaghetti line of where the actual climate system is going just happened to have some big deviations and we don't really know why, um, we, but we're, um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot that we still don't understand about those mechanisms of internal variability, but the hope is with better observations and reducing those uncertainties, that's what we'll be able to uh, pull that out more, more accurately. So that's the goal, uh, but I would say we're still working on it, so. I want to add one thing to that, and that, you know, my motivation, I was talking primarily about the global carbon budget. But when we start to get to situations in which carbon dioxide removal projects are being implemented in the ocean, we have got to get our stuff together when it comes to being able to monitor and verify the carbon sequestration of those projects and understand the ecosystem impact. And 
to do that, you have to understand all the natural variability that's happening in that region. And we don't even understand that. We don't understand the background state enough to know what's going to happen when these companies go out there and start putting these projects in the ocean. It's just we have so much work on that. It's just overwhelming. Hi. Um, this is Jamie Palter from the University of Rhode Island. And um, thanks for an awesome first session. Great kickoff. Really enjoyed it. Um, my question has to do with uncertainty. And so when we look at the uncertainties, Liddy did a great job showing um, that we have like pretty good agreement now between these DIC methods and surface flux methods. They're both about three plus or minus 0.3, so it's like 10%. But then if we think about any uncertainty in any given piece of it, like in the river fluxes, it's 0.3. And like if you thought about the air sea gas exchange coefficient, like that's a huge uncertainty, bigger than 10%. And so how are we, are we kind of getting this global estimate to agree so well? Is there a bit of luck? Um, and what does it hide in terms of our understanding or if I maybe could comment on, on, and I think that's your theme, right, is the gap. So where is that hiding, all that uncertainty? I, I would like to say a few words to that. Yeah, that, that's what I, what I wanted to to say in my introduction. So if you want them to agree, you can make them agree. You can turn it around. If you don't want them to agree, you use a smaller river flux correction. So they start, as Lydia said, from 0.2 up to uh, 0.8 with, uh, with a raised number in between. If you want them to agree, yes, you take the higher number. If you want, don't want them to agree, you take the lower number. So there's a few key uncertainties, one of them being the river flux. The RCCO2 uh, gas exchange is obviously a, um, a big one as well. So Alize, uh, who's here as well, she estimated that one to be about 20% of the, of the net flux. The, the beauty of the interior uh, ocean accumulation is that it doesn't have that uncertainty. So, um, so we can actually constrain it and a bit of that, that uncertainty from the interior. Um, another one that this hasn't been addressed much uh, today was is, is area coverage. So we still sort of don't, don't include marginal seas. Uh, the Arctic is only poorly uh, incorporated in this, this PCO2 estimates. Um, also in part because we don't have satellite measurements in a high latitude, the ice zones um, are also part of the uncertainty. So, yes, there is a, there's a red tail of corrections that we have to apply to make them comparable in the first place. And then you still are, you know, have, have a combined red tail of uncertainties that you, that you have to consider. So I think we're getting closer by sort of improving every single component of them, improving sort of the sort of what, what the surface PCO2 upscaled, measure, uh, upscaled uh, estimates are good at is um, sort of reconstructing the sea surface PCO2. If we can sort of, uh, in the same time, sort of improve sort of our understanding of the SCCO2 flux, we can reduce the uncertainty there. If we're sort of up, sort of getting better in sort of incorporating ocean regions that have previously sort of not been recognized and sort of improve like the knowledge of the, the real flux, like um, like Ray presented. So if we can sort of reduce the uncertainty of every single puzzle piece will in the end reduce the uncertainty of the, the individual components. And then we can do this comparison again, I would say. And then, then we sort of, you know, then it's not, not a cheating game. Then it's really, uh, then we will see whether we agree or we don't agree. Maybe to add on as well, um, because you asked about if, is it luck that they agree uh, so well? Um, I think if we if we look at individual grid cells and compare them, we're we're not as confident. And locally, the uncertainty can be um, a, quite a, quite high. But then, when once we integrate globally, um, an underestimation here can be offset by an overestimation here. So the global or like the basin scale estimates, I think they um, they agree really well with each other. For yeah, not necessarily luck reasons, but yeah, by by the fact that things cancel each other out. Uh, can I? Yeah, I'm Wei Jun Tai. Uh, so earlier I asked this question about that, how do we divide that river flux, you know, how much is counted or counted twice. But uh, Peter, you know, as to talk about that, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but uh, just ask a related question. Was pre-industrial ocean we know as a source of CO2 because uh, the, you have to burn terrestrial carbon uh, but uh, in the more recent uh, coastal ocean model, uh, uh, PS group present, and also in, in this paper you guys just published, pre-industrial ocean was uh, like a CO2 sink. So do we have, uh, how do we reconcile that? Yeah, 
Are you talking about, excuse me, are you talking about the pre-industrial coastal, coastal ocean? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. So the, so you're, yeah, I forget the exact number. Is it 0.1? It's smaller than now, of course. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. We kind of believe it should be a source of CO2. That the, that the pre-industrial pre coastal time. ocean should be a source of, of CO2. That, that was, you know, like right. the Bauer all review and, and yeah. several paper. But now it seems it was argued it was already a sink. Right. So I just feel harder to reconcile that with this overall idea that the ocean should be pre-industry time a source. And coastal ocean probably even stronger because most of the carbon will burn there, right? I mean, there's also nutrients being delivered. Do you feel like that's not enough to stimulate a like right. net, so net autotrophy or something in the in the coastal ocean? And so there was two arguments. One is just like Alan said, atmospheric CO2 to increase. That's the main driver, sure. similar to open ocean. Right. Another is the nutrient input. Right. But a pre-industry time. Yeah, so that's my question. If that is already a sink, it's very hard to reconcile this uh, idea of like the overall ocean being a source. Yeah, that's. I think that's a modeling result um, uh, out of out of Pierre's Pierre's group, and I'm not quite sure how they. Maybe someone in the audience knows how exactly they um, defend that or why the model comes out with that. Um, result, but there are. I guess what I was trying to get at with the nutrients. I don't know if this is the reason, but you know, in addition to carbon being delivered from from rivers, there's also nitrogen, and that would that would stimulate um, photosynthesis and and CO2 drawdown, and that could be part of part of the reason why there's a CO2 sink in coastal waters. But but I really I, I don't know exactly what's going on in that um, modeling. Yeah. So I think that this number comes from the, um, the study of Fabrice Lacroix and Timothy Bourgeois, so from the MPI models. And their study, they said that we under-evaluate the nutrient impact. So um, their study just highlights that maybe the pre-industrial, it's a coastal ocean, it's already a CO2 source. But there is still this debate, you know, some study thinks a CO2 source and other things CO2 sink. So yeah, it's from the modeling of Okay, let's go on to another question. Yeah, hi. Um, this is uh, Katsumi Matsumoto. Um, I have a question for Galen. Uh, so I think you said that um, the models disagree quite a bit and that the model results uh, deviate from the product's estimate uh, more recently. Um, and I wonder if that's because uh, you didn't wait uh, the results of the model by their skill. I suspect that you sort of democratically um, assign the same weight to all the models, but you know, if you think about data, they do data quality control, so you throw out bad data, right? So model, I mean, as modelers, we know that, right? So I wonder if that the things that you mentioned are you know, partly a result of the choice that you made. Yeah, so what we focused on in, in the paper, the FAE and McKinley 2021, we focused on the, the long-term mean sink in the models and asked the question, since we, since we think that the data products do a pretty good job at the large-scale regional means and seasonality, which models agree? Uh, and, um, and so with that, we found, in fact, that only, um, only three models are consistently consistently within three sigma of uh, the products, and that includes the riverine input and its uncertainty in those estimates. So that's a pretty b broad range, and only three of nine models were within that. So we did not actually then go to the step of saying, what if we only evaluate the mo these models, but you certainly could do that. And that was sort of the invitation in that paper, quite honestly, um, is maybe this would be a way for us to select the models. The other approach I showed in my, my talk is what if we just correct the models with the observations? I mean, if our goal is really to get a better estimate, uh, maybe, maybe that's another approach. Uh, that that's our last one, because we're already over time. Oh, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dwight Gledhill, NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. So I'm going to wear my bean counter hat here, because I'm a little 
taken back by this idea that we do not have any evidence that the, uh, the biological pump in the ocean has changed one way or another, definitive evidence on that. So after many tens of millions of dollars over the past decade or more, I'm a little unnerved that we can't you know, state that unequivocally at this point, one way or another. What have we been missing <laughs> uh, as we go forward so that in 10 years when I come back here, we can say with certainty one way or another if, in fact, that biological pump is, in fact, changing? I think that's a great segue to the next session. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think the way I understand it, and the speakers of the next session will correct me if I'm wrong, you know, we currently have an uncertainty in the biological pump. Uh, the, the range I hear is 5 to 12 petagrams of carbon per year. And if, if that's the uncertainty in the mean, I mean, that tells you that we're going to have a hard time uh, detecting uh, change certainly change outside the natural internal variability in the system that we also just don't have a lot of capacity to, to constrain, right? Our satellite record started in 1998, but yet the likely timescales of the time on which we need to have data in order to identify change in the biological pump is like 30 years from Stephanie Henson's work, right? So I think it's just a question of a timescale mismatch between the observations we've taken our understanding of all the processes and the timescales of likely change and the magnitude of variability, of course. The magnitude of variability makes it hard, right? pH is much easier to observe change because it's such a strong signal and the relative internal variability is much smaller. Thank you all again for a fantastic session.